Uh, you have probably heard about Captain Sam Brown. He fought in Afghanistan. He was in Kandahar. He was wounded by an IED. He retired as a captain, moved back home. He and his wife started helping veterans. And he is one of the best recruits for the Senate. I know Senator McConnell and I will be talking about his race later to emphasize he's got just a heck of a personal story, but also the convictions to run for the United States Senate in a swing state that's been swinging more and more in our direction. Um, but more than that, he's also got a heart for service, uh, having served his country and now serving to help veterans and now to take that to the next level in the United States Senate. So it really is my pleasure. I like one of the, the people I really, really, really wanted to move heaven and earth to get in his campaign was so, so willing to reach out and say, yes, we can make this happen. So he's flown in from Nevada we'll go home but we've got him for the next 30 minutes i can't wait to introduce you to captain sam brown the next united states Senator. so oh uh, look you got any more stylish shoes than man socks oh, that sucks that's fine so let's talk about your personal story first. Um, you you serve in Afghanistan, uh, wounded in Kandahar, and, and retire as a captain. Um, first of all, you're a West Point grad, correct? That's right. That's right. Um, some of us uh, chose West Point over the Naval Academy and Air Force Academy. Any, uh, any, any academy grads out here? None? None? <laughs> All right, you guys are all smarter than me, I guess. <laughs> so, it, how long were you in Afghanistan? That, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I'll put it to you this way. Um, anyone familiar with uh, U.S. Army Ranger School, uh, you know, based right here out of the great state of Georgia? Yes. Yeah. All right. So, so I recycled one of the phases, which meant I spent, like, roughly 80 days in Ranger School, uh, which meant I was in Afghanistan just short of that. Um, it was really early into, into my deployment, and, you know, Eric, the thing that was tough, there's multiple things that was tough about getting wounded, but one of them is, if you go back to my history, I was raised by parents that instilled in me at a very early age, and I'm not joking, my father literally ordered the West Point Academic Catalog when I was 10 years old. He, this is before emails and stuff, and he wrote to the West Point Admissions Office and said, please send a catalog. And, and I went and checked the mail and I saw, saw it and I didn't know what it was. I had to wait for him to get home from work and I asked him, I said, Father, what is this? Because it was pictures of these castle-like buildings and you know, young people in these Civil War era looking uniforms. And he said, son, that's West Point. You can go there one day. And so that seed was planted at a very young age and it was, you know, it was nurtured. And so as I you know, approached my senior year in high school, I had, I had already applied I was, I was committed to going to a service academy. I didn't apply to any civilian schools at all. And our country was attacked on 9-11. A few short months later, I got my acceptance letter to West Point, less than a year after 9-11. I'm raising my right hand for the first time in service to this country on the, on the banks of the Hudson River. And, and so I had spent my entire adolescent life, four years at West Point, a year at Fort Benning, a year at Fort Hood, Texas, training with my with my battalion to go lead troops in combat overseas for this nation and to have all of that at 24 years old go up in smoke. I lost at that moment my professional identity and my personal identity because I was no longer recognizable. And that was one of the toughest things in the world, was to have been committed to a life of service. And the only way that I knew what it could look like was in uniform. And to have that just go away. And, and I'm blessed, though, that in the midst of that, that period, that, that time of suffering, to have, well, I didn't find her. She found me. But my wife met me when I was in the ICU. Amy, Amy was, uh, was in the Army as well. Um, she, she worked in the ICU as a dietitian. She saw me when I was intubated, you know, wrapped head to toe in gauze. 
and I met her a couple months later. Uh, but what Amy and I are doing is a mission together, which is serving this country again. And this is a this is a um, an act of service from both of us. But I wouldn't be here without her. I, I'm I'm sitting here thinking. Uh, your dad got you a West Point catalog at 10. I got my son a Lego catalog. I, <laughs> I know how my parenting skills are. It makes you feel any better. I have not got my children a West Point catalog. <laughs> <laughs> so you, 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 you talk about this mission in, in, in Blessed, and we've, we've just met. And so can I ask you the, the probative question that I normally don't meet to people I meet immediately, but... Uh, using the language I'm hearing you use, can you talk about your recovery and, and your faith in that? Absolutely. Uh, look, the moment I, the moment that bomb went off, and it went off under our Humvee, right on at the fuel tank. So I was soaked in diesel fuel. I was, I was, the diesel fuel was burning off of my body. And when that happened, it was the first time in my life. Again, I was a young man, I was 24. But at that point, I believed I was invincible and I believed I knew everything. And so at 24, <clears throat> to now encounter something that I, I knew in a moment was bigger than me, I couldn't overcome on my own. It humbled me, it crushed me to the point where the only response I had was to throw my arms in the air and scream out to my God and my creator. After that, I tried to stop, drop, and roll. It wasn't working. My face was on fire. I couldn't see anything. The only thing I could hear was my own voice screaming. And you can't manufacture that scream. It's a, it's a sickening sound to hear a man who believes he's about to die screaming for God and for his mom. And I got to this place where I realized I, I had no ability to control an outcome even an outcome of saving my own life. And so I thought, how long is it going to take to burn to death? What's the transition from this life to the next going to be like? And I made the decision to give up the world to live. The version of me died at that moment. Death was going to be a relief. And then I heard the most powerful words I've ever heard. And it didn't come from a historical figure. It didn't come from one of my you know, commanding officers or a general or even a sergeant major. It came from my E4 gunner, a guy who had just been in the truck with me. He'd been burned himself, got it out, and he ran to me and said, sir, I've got you. And the miracle of that moment was when I went from a place of having given up the will to live, to just by hearing those words and feeling him, his body and the dirt smothering me, I knew I was going to survive. And hope was reignited. And what's important here as a lesson for all of us is no one here knows anybody in D.C., right? <laughs> <laughs> How often do people use their words to try and encourage us or to deliver hope? And there's no action. Words without action are meaningless when someone is desperate. Now, if someone's just having a little bit of a bad day, words might be enough. But when someone believes that their life, either literally or metaphorically, could end, they need more than words. They need action. That's what I discovered that day at 24 years old. And it came from a young man from South Texas who was in my truck, who put himself in harm's way, had already been wounded himself, and he taught me the greatest lesson of my life. And so through the next three years of my recovery, I had no doubt that I was here for a reason. And I've been on this journey for the last almost 16 years of trying to discover, you know, from day to day, month to month, year to year, what is that purpose? And eventually it became to be the best husband I can be to Amy, to be the best father I can be to my three children, to admit that West Point does a lot to teach you about leadership, but it doesn't teach you a lot about the fundamentals of business. So I had to go back to school and get my MBA. And then to start a business that serves veterans. To, to, to fill a need that the, the VA couldn't do. I mean, look, the VA, anyone ever heard any criticism of the VA here? <laughs> uh, look, I'm gonna tell you the truth. I've gone to the VA consistently since I was medically retired because I knew people were gonna ask me, Sam, what's the VA like? And if I didn't participate, even though I had other options, 
then I would either have no, no credibility in my response, or I would just have to say, I don't, I don't know. Um, so I've, I've, I've always used the VA, but the VA is an imperfect system. And so our business filled that need when, when veterans needed medication same day to a clinic that didn't have pharmaceutical support on site, we were there to fill that gap. And, and, I, and I loved serving the community that way. But ultimately, service to country, um, that call came again. Not in uniform, not through my business, but through politics. Afghanistan and, and recovery, and, and you really want to go to the United States Senate? <laughs> no, no, those are your words. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure you'll find me in an interview anywhere saying I want to go to the United States Senate. Okay, let's be clear. Um, we live. I've got a, I've got a great life, a successful business with a with a, a great marriage, healthy children, and, and a place where look. I was skiing 20 days a year. We live 45 minutes from Lake Tahoe. I mean, this is a great life I've got. Um, so I am, I am willing to serve in the United States Senate. And my wife would tell me, in fact, this is what she did tell me as I was wrestling with this. She said, Sam, we're all given talents. We're all gifted with something. Are you maximizing the stewardship of your talents as a business owner, or are you maximizing your talents as a U.S. Senator? And when I thought about that, when I had to pray about that, when I looked deep within myself, I realized that the selfish version of me wanted nothing to do with it. But the part of me that God created me in my own unique way and, and with, the, with the experiences I've had in life, that was the best stewardship of my talents. Um, the, the law of politics in this moment because there was a Senate race in 2022 and a governor's race statewide in Nevada. Notice I'm saying Nevada, I learned it's Nevada, not Nevada. Um, that we lost that center race. We didn't win the governor's race. And so now two years later, we're now in a presidential cycle, which has higher turnout. I would note that the incumbent Democrat doesn't poll very well for being an incumbent Democrat, well below 50%. But how do you look at this race compared to 2022 that says this year is a viable race? Uh, look, that's a, that's a fair question. And I, I, I go back and I lean on you know, our, our, the basic education and training I received at West Point. Now when we study, when we study battles in military history, we don't just study the battles we win and say, all right, you know, when we're in this situation, here's the, here's the game plan, here's how we're gonna execute to get another one. You study the losses as well. And so that's, that's what I did last cycle. And so you actually have this incredible sort of laboratory of two experiments going on simultaneously in almost identical conditions, um, and you you can sort of test and and you know hold some of the uh, you know some of the different functions against one another. And, and what I discovered is that um, the campaigns ran slightly different strategies. Uh, in the in the Senate race, the team there appeared to believe that. Pushing for a strong Republican-based turnout in the general election was the key to victory. In the governor's race, they not that they ignored it, because they, they, they you know tended to those relationships some, but they pushed into the middle for independence and went in and, and pursued getting that buy-in, getting that commitment of a vote. And at the end of the day, uh, I believe that that difference in strategy is what led to a difference in those results. And so how do I apply that forward? Well, it, it helps to come out of the primary with you know a landslide victory. I mean, I won 60% of the vote in a field of 12. Um, the next closest person was 45 points behind me. So we've got a really unified base now. And, um, you know, 
President Trump has made Nevada a real target for his battleground plans. And, and, it, and it helps to have you know, his voice saying, Nevada's important, but Sam Brown is important too. And, and so now I'm able to focus on those voters who might not identify as a Republican. Um, in fact, I'll put it to you this way. I'll tell you what our voter registration looks like. There's only 18,000 registered voter difference between Republicans and Democrats, 30-30. That means 40% are in the middle, 40%. So shouldn't we focus on pursuing those people? You know, 30% of our, of our um, residents are Hispanic voters. Um, we've got, uh, you know, incredible communities of Asian Americans Know, conservative family values. Republicans have never pursued a relationship with. Them. Um, we've got union workers who are who are you know really disaffected by this Biden economy. Prices are in fact the economy is the number one issue for our independent voters. Thirty six percent say that's their number one issue. When median household income is sixty four thousand dollars, but median home prices are over four hundred thousand dollars in the Vegas market and over five hundred thousand dollars in the Reno market, there are people who are worried about Pavlov's hierarchy needs. We have a roof over our head, food on the table, gas in the car. There's a lot of people that are scared. That's not going to be there. Well, let's talk about those issues because I, I was I was out there just a couple of weeks ago with a buddy of mine and I got recognized by. A, one of the people in the casino we were staying in, and was he was talking about that particular issue, the, the economy. Just I mean, for you, you got Reno, Carson City, you, you got Lake Tahoe, you have Vegas is such major population hub. And he's like, we're having conferences and not seeing as many people come. Um, we're we're not seeing as many people in the local restaurants. To the extent people are coming, they don't venture out as much. They don't spend as much in the casinos. And I got to imagine that all of that just causes an economic spillover effect to. The local businesses, the restaurants, the, the used car dealer lots. Yeah, it, it does. In fact, we've got the second highest unemployment rate in the nation. Um, you know, compounding economic stresses, we have the second highest energy cost in the nation. Our our at home utility bills, because uh, we've got this you know this pursuit of these mandates on renewable energy goals and power production, double in eighteen months. It actually doubled. 12 months, but you know, it started 18 months ago. Um, and so people who are living paycheck to paycheck, a lot of people living on tips, by the way, and President Trump's pledge to eliminate taxes on tips matters a lot in a state like Nevada. And I know it matters in other places too, but it matters it matters so much. There's only two Democrat senators who have signed on to Ted Cruz's bill to eliminate taxes on tips. There were two Democrat senators from the back, but only after they both criticized him. And went as far as Jackie Rose and my opponent actually, her, her her statement went so far as to say this is a this policy is going to hurt working class Nevadans. If someone can explain that to me, <laughs> I'll be right off stage here in a little bit, and I'd love to know how that how that works. Um, but. Look, they heard from they heard from the people. The people said, "This is this. We want this. This is ludicrous. Your denial of that is actually going to hurt us." And so they reversed course. Um, another another thing that President Trump has just recently said, and I think, look, in my view, the government taxes us too much. But if someone has gotten to a place in their life where they are earning their Social Security back, why are we paying taxes on that? It was, it was literally taxed to begin with. And, and so we have many, many retirees in Nevada. You know, these are issues that affect these major concerns. So there, one more little story. Um, one of my neighbors, you know, and, and I knew her well before I got into you know, running for office, she stopped me about two years ago and said one day we were in our driveways and she said, hey, Sam, I just want to let you know that um, if you notice things happening around the house, in other words, if someone's messing with my stuff, between these hours, just know that I'm not home. And I said, sure, what's going on? She said, I had to go back to work. 
You know, I was living off Social Security and a reverse mortgage, and things got too expensive. I can't make ends meet anymore. I had to go back to work. And so, you know, on days when I'm catching a flight and I've got to be to the airport at, you know, 5 a.m., I see Shirley with the garage door open and she's getting ready to go to work at 4.30 in the morning because things have gotten so expensive that even though she did the right things and she has Social Security and she, you know, and she went, you know, dug a little deeper and reverse mortgaged her home, it's not enough. And people need relief. They need leaders who understand the issues. And it's not just a matter of the words. You have to have action to provide help. One of the other issues that I, I would imagine affects Nevada, and it, it's one of those weird ones where I hear Democrats all the time say we have to have the illegal aliens to to pick the crops and do the work that others don't want to do, but I, I got to imagine illegal immigration in Nevada is a big issue. It is a big issue, um, and, but even more broadly speaking, the border is a big issue um, because it's not just a matter of illegal immigration. It's, it's, the, it's the, the things that happen when you have a border policy that isn't effectively open. You know, fentanyl has killed more people than warfare has. You know, we're losing 100,000 Americans a year. And, and, and it's agnostic of you know, race, creed, community. Uh, it's, it's terrorizing our, our state. Uh, the sheriffs tell me that their number one thing I talked to them thinking on them, and initially I thought it's going to be some you know kind of localized issue or something like. And I was like, what's what's your number one concern? It's the border. It's the border. You know, you've got human trafficking. You've got the drugs. Um, you've got you know people who are coming into our country and our systems, whether it's healthcare system, education system, just housing supply, isn't there to be able to hold. It. And we're not even getting into like the terrorists who are coming into this country. Um, so yeah, that's that's the number two issue for our voters. You know, it's it's interesting to me. Every time I ask someone, regardless of what they're running for, whatever state they're running from, running in, what the big issue is, it people bring up the border, which I kind of expect, but fentanyl because of the border, that it affects that many people in that many states. It's just it's remarkable to me. Tragic. Now, on the practical aspect of running for office in, in Nevada, you, you've got, I mean, you, you do have this population center in, in Las Vegas, and it seems like you've got to turn out Clark County, but how do you, in a state like Nevada, maximize, like, I, I know the Laxalt campaign and others, they, they wanted to rely on Republican turnout in the rest of the state, but uh, what do you do strategically as a campaign to make sure you're maximizing your turnout there? Um, we're, we're talking about which kind of the new voters we're going after. So, you know, part of it is you're trying to build relationships with people who you haven't had a relationship with before. Um, so I, I talked about, for example, you know, the 30% of our, of our you know, residents out there who are Hispanic. Um, we started running ads in Spanish a couple of months ago. This is something that otherwise had been happening like Basically, you know, after Labor Day type thing. And I, and I think it's a natural human response that if, if somebody cares about us and they want to build a relationship, they're going to engage with us over time. Uh, you know, the first time somebody comes to you and asks you for something, um, and there's not a relationship established, there's not, you know, there's not credibility, there's not rapport. Uh, it can be off-putting, and that's what we have been doing politically to folks that we hope, want, or you know, need to vote for us. Um, so we've been, you know, we've been running ads in Spanish, we've been running ads um, in, you know, in English as well. But we're we're pursuing those relationships early, um, and, and we also, you know, we have a we have kind of a a climate of I can't win this alone. I can't, I can't win this. Sam Brown can't win the Senate race alone. Uh, it takes voters, it takes donors, it takes volunteers, and frankly, it takes a coalition of others that care about the Nevada Senate race from around the country to, to get there, whether in person or through resources, to invest in it because it's worth investing in. And we're seeing that. We're seeing organizations, people, um, you know, just. Uh, 
uh, whether it's small dollar donors or, or you know, big enterprises, they believe in Nevada, they believe in this race, and that's how we win. Now, one of the issues, of course, is your opponent who has been pretty much in lockstep with Biden and Harris along the way, voting on eating all the packages that even Larry Summers <laughs> would drive up and play. Um, it, it seems more and more that there is a, we mentioned the economy, we mentioned the border and immigration, that uh, she just, the fact that her polling, she can't get above 50% seems like it's a, a ripe opportunity and, and a viable pickup seat. It's, it's incredible, incredibly viable. And you know, there's people who have studied campaigns and politics longer than me that could probably give uh, really eloquent responses to this. I'll, I'll tell you this. Here's how I feel about it. I've got guarded optimism. What I mean by that is the conditions are there for us to win. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you know, buried with, you know, terrible unfavorables coming out of the hole. Uh, in fact, my favorables and unfavorables are basically in a dead, dead even, despite the fact that, you know, Schumer's PACs and, and Rosen's, you know, campaign money has been spending millions of dollars to try and negatively define me. They can't put me underwater. Um, and. You know, we've got resources. You know, I, I, I say there's three things that have to come together in these tough battleground races. You have to have the right candidate with the right resources and the right strategy. And I believe we have all three of those elements. But what we can't do is is try and surf a wave and, and you know and expect other things to you know other conditions to, to lead to a win. Um, I've seen you know cases where people have let off the throttle. You know, two months out, like, oh, hey, polls look great. We're going to win this thing and coast through. No, this campaign is going to be run like we're five points behind, regardless of what the polls say, all the way through November 5th. So if people here in the room want to be able to support the campaign from where they are, what should they be thinking about doing? Where should they go on the Internet? Yeah, um, people can go to my website. It's a great place to start, captainsambrown.com. Um, you know, and, and people, like, if you live in Nevada, I want your vote. Um, if you don't live in Nevada, there's ways to either contribute, you know, through money through the, the campaign website. But technology allows people to even volunteer. Not everyone can give money. You know, it's, it's I understand that. But to those who can, please contribute directly to the campaign. And otherwise, you know, people can make phone calls. You know, you can you can virtually help out the campaign in other ways. And, and when we have such high stakes this election cycle and so few opportunities to win battleground Senate seats to take back the majority. We need the country to mobilize around those races uh, and, and really help us to win, even if it's from afar. Now, last thing for you. We've talked about the economy and the issues, but in my sense of things in, in having done this for a while, everybody who goes to Congress actually does have something that, like, is their passion, that I get there, this is the thing I want to do. If I get to the Senate or the House, what's yours? I, I want to I want to tackle the the financial hardship thing first because that's where I see the most concern out of my voters. Um, people people are scared. They are legitimately scared. When you have um, homeless numbers are up, um, and I guarantee you, within this room, probably everybody knows somebody who's now homeless who five years ago wasn't. You might not know it might be sleeping in someone else's home, a relative, they might even be sleeping in their car, but taking showers at the gym. Uh, but people are scared. And so, you know, the things that I can do, whether it's extending tax cuts, um, you know, pursuing vigorously American energy uh, security uh, to help bring down prices, um, if it's, you know, getting bureaucracy out of the way that, that tangles up and puts friction on small businesses, these are things that we can start pursuing on day one. Um, you know, making sure that we secure the borders so we're not dealing with this influx of people who, who are you know, just uh, you know, taking jobs, who are, who are you know, flooding our healthcare system. Our education. Like, these, are, these are the issues that we can start to tackle on day one that uh, are my number one concern because that's my constituents' number one concern. Captain Sam Brown, thank you for making the trip from Nevada all the way out here to hang out with us. Best of luck on the campaign. Thank you for your service, and I hope you get to
candidate we should be rallying behind to get to the U.S. Senate. Absolutely. Y'all, I, I am kind of overwhelmed that um, for the first time since 2019, Senator McConnell would do an event outside of Kentucky and would come to Georgia. And I, I've thought a lot about how to introduce someone who I have in my career in politics praised and criticized back and forth repeatedly. Uh, he, I, but I think at, at, at this venture, at, at this point in time, when I look back, one of the criticisms that I think Senator McConnell has gotten over time is that, well, it doesn't matter any Senate leader would do this. He said, I remember when I was in college and there was a government shutdown and George Stephanopoulos actually wrote in his book that uh, Bill Clinton's administration was within 24 hours of caving to the Republicans in the House. And he got a call from then Senate Republican leader Bob Dole that the Senate Republicans had come together and they would stop the And then I remember all of the judicial fights in the beginning of the Bush administration where Senate Majority Leader Lott and then Frisk wouldn't fight aggressively for those Republican judicial picks that Democrats wanted to block and filibuster. And I remember the, the betrayal of so many Republicans who wanted to pass a bipartisan campaign finance reform that would just hurt Americans' ability to participate in politics. And in each of those fights, there was a senator from Kentucky who was willing to stand up and fight even when leadership wouldn't and ultimately got rewarded with that leadership. And here, as he's finishing his tenure as the longest serving Republican leader, and Republicans oftentimes get frustrated and complain, well, we have a United States Supreme Court with a 6-3 conservative majority, and we would not have that Supreme Court but for one man willing to say, I'll take all the blame, I'm not putting Merrick Garland on the Supreme Court. And <laughs> And he knew, by virtue of being the senator from Kentucky, that as long as Kentuckians were happy with him, he could do this. And Kentuckians have continued to reward him and send him to the Senate. The Republicans in the Senate have continued to make him the leader. And because of that leadership, what have we gotten? We've gotten the United States Supreme Court, but not just them. We've gotten a rapid push over time to appoint conservatives so that the majority of circuits in the United States judicial system are controlled now by conservatives who are beginning to roll back insanity, even in places like the Ninth Circuit in California. But it's not just judges as well. There's been a strategic play over time to be able to grow a Senate Republican base that actually looks very much like America. And sometimes I, as a conservative, complain and say, well, why won't the Senate Republicans do this? And then other times I look at this and say, oh, you know, if we didn't have them there willing to say, I'm willing to be the bad guy and be hated to stop this, things would be a whole lot worse because I've seen Republicans in the past cave. What I never see is Mitch McConnell cave. Whether I like it or not, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you on stage the Senate Republican leader, the Senator from Kentucky, Mitch McConnell. told your staff the other day that they, they called me and I didn't realize I had a call with them until I was sitting at my computer and I got a notice they were waiting for me on the Zoom call. And they said, unlike the president, Senator McConnell doesn't need your questions in advance. And he said, we just like to kind of know the general topics. And I said, well, I wanted to introduce him as a the Senate Republican leader who used to be a damn dirty appropriator. So well, he still is a damn dirty appropriator in the Senate, but that's okay. Um, I do want to ask you to begin with, you and I, when we had a conversation back earlier this year with my son, who, by the way, his hair is even taller than it was, we were together. We spent a lot of time talking about our role in the world and how my growing up overseas and your role in the Senate, we have this sense that there is something about this country that if we don't lead, others will fill the vacuum who don't share our worldview. And would love to have your thoughts on that. Occasionally, these isolationist moves, it happened in the 30s, 
slogan, interestingly enough, was America First. That stopped after Pearl Harbor. But then most of the Republicans, including the most prominent Republican at that time, Robert Taft, didn't even support NATO or the Marshall Plan to get the uh, Europeans back on their feet. Well, obviously, after the creation of NATO, it worked. Reagan's approach was, you want to get peace, you do it through strength, through strength, through having your adversaries fear you. And I fear, using the word fear again, that the uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan was almost like sending a green light to Putin. Maybe this is a good time to try it because America's going home. We now have seen over a period of time the axis of powerful authoritarian regimes. They're all talking to each other, North Korea, China, Russia, Iran, Iran's proxies. So I think the biggest challenge facing the next administration and for the, maybe for the future, is for America to look strong and to be strong. The Biden administration sent up four straight budgets and didn't even keep up with inflation. That doesn't go to cut it. Now, there are those in our party, for example, who say, well, it costs too much. Well, at the height of the war, in World War II, we were spending 37% of our gross domestic product on defense, 37%. Now, two or three percent is considered adequate. And of course, millions of people were getting killed. So getting into a war is way more expensive than avoiding one. And so I think if I had a message for the next administration, and we all know who we hope will be the next administration, take this seriously. It's the single biggest problem confronting the country right now. When President Biden was in his first term in the Senate, <laughs> President Monroe offered up the Monroe Doctrine, trying to get Monroe's out of the Western Hemisphere. I read in the Wall Street Journal not that long ago that people don't realize the Iranians, the Chinese, and the Russians are all in Venezuela right now. Um, it, it, we have a deteriorated situation in Haiti. We have uh, the Peru and, and Chile also getting in deals with China. It seems like everywhere you look, the Chinese, the Iranians, and the Russians are cropping up now in the Western Hemisphere. Well, they hate what we stand for. I mean, we have relatively open societies in most of the countries in the world where people actually get to vote on who get to be in charge. And uh, that, of course, seems to the Chinese and the Russians unwieldy. Those democratic elections, they can go either way. Of course, that's the beauty of a free society, is you do have open public debate about reaching decisions. They interpret that as weakness. And so they have pulled together, directly together, President Xi of China went to Moscow this year and said, we are gonna be friends forever. And they are collectively a huge challenge to us. And the, the good news is there are two new countries in NATO, Finland and Sweden. Uh, 23 countries in NATO are now hitting the 2% of GDP for defense. That was about three countries a couple of years ago. The Japanese prime minister addressing the U.S. Congress said, you want to send President Xi a message? be Putin in Ukraine. So it has unified the democratic world, and that's the good part. And I think all of us collectively, if we need it, if we do what we need to do in our defense spending, are a lot more influential than the axis of evil. Let me move to the Senate. Um, when you talk either at a state level or the federal level, oftentimes, members of Congress will say that the opposition is the Democrats and the enemy is the other House in Congress. Um, 
House members, of course, in fact, normally when I do this event, the House members want to come on a day that the Senate members aren't present and vice versa. Um, what makes the United States Senate the unique institution it is? It's probably the only democratic institution in the, in the world where a majority is not enough. The filibuster means that on any matter that's in contention, you have to get 60 votes, not just 51, to go forward. It's always frustrating when you're in the majority, liberating when you're in the minority, but it's the essence of the Senate. Going all the way back to George Washington, according to, to legend, he was asked, what do you think the Senate's going to be like? He said he thought it'd be like the saucer under the teacup. The tea would slosh out of the cups and into the saucer and cool off. Cool off. So the Senate, Eric, has killed so many bad things over the history of our country, you wouldn't believe it. And uh, it was meant to be slow. It was meant to be collaborative or to kill bad stuff. And so <clears throat> the way I measure success in the Senate frequently is not what we did, but what we didn't do. And in the time that I've been there, we've stopped an awful lot of really bad things. But then once in a while, you get to be in the majority. By the way, I've been the majority leader. I've been the minority leader. Majority better. <laughs> If the stars aligned as they did during the previous administration, and I was the majority leader, and I was the majority leader in the last two years of Barack Obama, and that provided the opportunity only majority leaders have to determine what you're gonna do or not do. The single biggest decision of my political career was the decision not to fill the vacancy in the Supreme Court in the middle of the 2016 election. <laughs> Everybody thought Hillary Clinton was going to win. Uh, we didn't even know who our nominee was going to be at the time I said that. And the Democrats were all laughing, the reporters were all laughing. All you're going to do is you know, allow Hillary Clinton to nominate somebody younger than Merrick Garland. Well, I thought it was a, an important opportunity to reserve for us in case we did end up in a position to do it. And so President Trump took very good advice from two White House counsels in a row. We collaborated both before and after nominations. And as the majority leader, I get to decide what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. And we took judges up first every time. Every single time judges came first. We got lucky. We had another Supreme Court appointment when Justice Kennedy retired. And then out of the blue, Justice Ginsburg passed away with about four months to go in the election in 2020. I remember that. President and I talked about that. I said, I think we've just got a chance here to meet and get this done before the election. Because I thought after the election, no matter who won, we lost the Senate or lost the White House, we wouldn't be able to put together the political support to get it done. We also had the pandemic going on. Now, I can remember one of my colleagues who were worried about getting everybody in some place, one of my colleagues said, well, I'll be there back to wear a space suit. <laughs> and everybody understood the importance of it. And we managed to get Andy Coney Barrett confirmed one week before the election. <laughs> hey. And then 54 circuit judges. And there's all kinds of uh, ridiculous comments about what the Federalist Society is. I'm a card-carrying believer in the Federalist Society. What does that mean? The principal goal of Federalist Society men and women is to take <coughs> what lawyers call the administrative state. Now, to interpret that, 
That means agencies and departments of the federal government doing things that were not authorized by people who actually got elected, like us. And so the first indication that everything was going to change was two years ago in the EPA versus West Virginia. EPA decided to regulate carbon. The Supreme Court obviously doesn't have an opinion about whether or not you ought to regulate carbon. All they said was Congress didn't give you the authority to do it. Wham, six to three, they couldn't do it. And just uh, a couple weeks ago, Chevron Deference, which was 50 years old, was the landmark decision that basically allowed the, the regulators to pretty much do what they wanted to. We had to defer to them. That's why they called it Chevron deference, overturned. So as I look back on my time as the majority leader, I thought, where could you have the most influence for the longest period of time? Obviously, taxes go up, taxes go down, policy changes depending upon the outcome of elections, but the one place where he could have a long-term impact on the country was lifetime appointments to the courts. And don't ever let anybody believe, convince you, you ought to have term limits for Supreme Court justices. The Constitution is very clear. It's a lifetime appointment. Lose that and you won't have an independent Supreme Court anymore. So, Joe Biden, Last week, he came out with his duty plan. <laughs> and I had an op-ed in the Washington Post last weekend just pointing out how what he was recommending was actually unconstitutional. So I think we have Eric had a long-term <laughs> positive impact on the country that will play out down through the years as these young men and women pursue their lifetime appointments. And it will have a huge impact on the future of our country and reinvigorate the Congress. We won't, we won't be able to just punch something in some agency and say, do what you want to do. Look, yeah. <laughs> you have been in charge of the National Republican, uh, the, the Senatorial Committee of the NRSC. You've been the majority leader, you've been the minority leader. We have a good group of recruits in a lot of states this year. We've got West Virginia, looks like it'll go our way because of Mansion. Uh, maybe Ohio. How do you see the map shaping up for 24 for the Senate? This is the best map I've ever seen. But one cautionary note I've seen us screw up maps before. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is the key to winning the Senate race in a competitive state? Candidate quality. And I'm not going to mention any names, but over the course of the last 10 to 15 years, in four or five different incidences, we have not had the kind of candidate who could appeal to a competitive state. That is not the case this year. I think we have outstanding candidates everywhere. I believe we've already won West Virginia. That's number 50. 51 is the magic number. Uh, we've got big races going on in Montana, Ohio. You just met Sam Brown, introduced him to your audience. Uh, we've even got a shot, believe it or not, in Maryland, and certainly in Pennsylvania, and maybe in some other states as well, including Nevada. But the magic number is 51, because that means the majority of you gets to decide what you're going so let's assume for a moment the worst case scenario. We lose the White House, we lose the House, but we do keep the Senate. That preserves the filibuster because they'll get rid of it. If they get all three, they'll get rid of the filibuster. They'll admit the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico as states. That's four new Democrats in perpetuity and they'll pack the Supreme Court. That's how radical Democrats are today and why it is so important to win this presidential race. On the practical aspect of, of the Senate, 
Um, trying to think of a way to be delicate on this one, on, on conservative criticisms that often come up in the Senate, the, the sense of frustration that we win the House and we win the Senate, but then Republican members of the Senate oftentimes then say, well, I don't want to do what the House does, and conservatives feel like the football has been snatched away. How do you explain to conservatives who oftentimes get frustrated outside of judges that there's a larger collaboration issue there? There's only one time when the Senate is popular. That's when Republicans are in the minority in the House. That's a fair point. So I've been through periods where they pray for us every night and clap for us every night. And periods when you're in the majority, when you do want to do more. And of course in the House, it's a majoritarian body. They run every two years. They're doing stuff differently year after year after year. The Senate is harder. Uh, the founders of this country didn't want to make it easy to make a law. If you're looking for speed or efficiency, you, you wouldn't like the Senate. But if you're interested in dividing power and trying to prevent the acquisition of power, the Senate is for you. And I think you have to measure success not by how many things you pass, but how many bad things you prevented. And when you had the opportunity to pass something, did it have a long time impact on the country? I've been the Republican leader longer than anybody, in any leader in American history. I've been up and down, but I think when we had the opportunity to move, we did two very important things. Judges, which will last for a long time, and a hugely successful tax reform bill in 2017, but taxes will begin to expire beginning next year. And so that's why it's important to our domestic economy for us to be able to continue to, to craft a tax bill that allows this economy to, to continue to vibe. Senator, I despise using the word legacy because I think those things sort themselves out. You have been the longest Senate Republican leader, and you'll give up that position after this election. Uh, we've talked about judges and how that will be cementing your career in, in not having Merrick Garland on the Supreme Court, but is there one thing that you look at and, and you wish you had been able to accomplish that you haven't been able to get done? One thing what? It, it's something that you haven't been able to get done that you regret not being able to get done so far? Yeah, that we haven't won more seats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean... history buffs, but if you'll indulge me just for a moment, senators were not even popularly elected until 1914. From 1914 to 2024, Republicans have never had more than 55. Democrats had massive majorities during the New Deal, during the LBJ, during the first two years of Barack Obama. I always remind people, winners make policy and losers go on. It's not complicated. If you really want to change, you have to win more races. And as I said earlier, I think there have been a, a, a number of cases in the last 10 or 15 years where we simply didn't have electable candidates in competitive states. <laughs> I might mention Georgia. <laughs> which still looks like a red state to me, but for a variety of different reasons that you all follow very closely. We, we now have two Democratic senators here. I think it's the only red state in America with two Democratic senators. And so those were missed opportunities. I could name some others, but those are ones that you're all familiar with. If, if we can, there's a growing worry, and, and Congressman Heard from Oklahoma with the Republican State Committee was here, and he and I have this concern about our fiscal uh, state as a country and, and the growing national debt. And 
what do you see is, is oh, Mitch Daniels, so let me back up here. Mitch Daniels had the op-ed in the Washington Post a couple months ago that he's afraid we're getting to the point where we're gonna have to have a crisis to force Washington to deal with the fiscal problems we have. How do you see that issue? Oh. Everybody's afraid to touch it, both sides. But the reason the debt is mounting, except for an emergency like the pandemic, are very, very popular in programs. Medicare, Social Security, extremely popular, essential to a whole lot of members. And uh, unless you adjust somehow the programs, they are going to tank us at some point, and I'm sure an adjustment will be made. The only question is when. The only time I can recall, and this is even before I, I got to the Senate, uh, Reagan and Tim O'Neill agreed to raise the age for Social Security to 67, which saved the program for a very lengthy period of time. The discretionary budget, the part that we actually vote on, remember on entitlements, we don't even vote on it. That happens automatically. In the discretionary programs, it hasn't been out of sight, but neither side has had the courage to say to the American people, we've got to make some adjustments here. Now, I think what the Democrats would do would be exacerbate the problem by making more things eligible and raise taxes to pay for them. Uh, the other way of looking at it is people are living longer and longer and longer. Would it make sense to have it kick in later? Big, big argument. I can't think of a cycle we've been in when we have been accused of trying to do something bad to Social Security, uh, which is not true. But the honest answer is the reason the debt is so large is because very, very popular programs that neither side has been able to stand up together and say to the American people, this is what we need. Do you think there's going to be, is it a crisis that might provoke them from coming together? Or is, is behind the scenes, is there any recognition that something's going to have to happen? Or it just seems like it becomes the, the political issue that, as they used to call it, the third rail no one wants to touch. And how do you see it playing out long term? I don't know when, but it's going to happen if we don't step up and do what's necessary. It can only be done on a bipartisan basis because of the sensitivity of the subject. I was running for the Senate the first time in 1984. It was the year after Reagan and Tip O'Neill agreed to raise the age of 67. Never mentioned. Wasn't well, asked a question about it because it was done on a bipartisan basis. I remember talking to President Obama, a very smart guy. We had several private conversations about this problem. He understood what the problem was. But he didn't want that to be his legacy. And uh, I give President Bush 43 a lot of credit because after he got reelected in 2004, he said, we're gonna tackle Social Security and see if we can fix it for the long term. We had a majority in the House, majority in the Senate, majority in the White House. We all do require bipartisan support I was the whip then, the number two position. So it became my responsibility to go around to the Democrats in the Senate to see who wanted to sign up to help us fix Social Security. Joe Lieberman, the most reasonable Democrat of all, said to me as follows, and this is the most cooperative, most reasonable Democrat. He said, you guys want to fix Social Security? Go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so there you had unified government trying to do it, but knowing full well that it was so politically toxic 
that they needed to have both sides involved. And the Democrats in the minority at the time said, oh, we're not gonna touch that. That means we're gonna run against you in the next election if you go forward. So I'm telling you all the reasons that it hasn't happened, but at some point it will. And it reminds me of the meltdown in 2008, you know, the financial crisis. Uh, we acted. It wasn't popular, uh, but we acted. I hate to see this go that far, but I think this uh, $37 trillion national debt is really unsustainable. Senator, you did get to the Senate in, in 1984, and, and if I remember right, Roger Ailes was involved with your race, and there were a whole lot of people who didn't expect a Republican to win in Kentucky. You did, and you've been there ever since, holding that seat. And it's it, Kentucky, I think, has been a remarkable shift to the state now that has moved so decisively Republican outside of occasional problematic Democratic governors there. Um, what do you think has led to the shift in places like Kentucky and elsewhere that have we now seen, where for 50 years, as you mentioned, Democrats have been able to win big, but it does seem like there are so many states that do seem to be moving to the right in the South and the Midwest. I, I think that in rural America and small town America, the Democrats' elitism has completely turned them off. You could see it becoming under coming under the Obama administration, it only picked up during the Trump administration. And it's my state's an example of it. And so is Iowa, and so is most of the, the middle part of the country. I mean, Eric, we do have a Democrat governor. It's an unusual situation. But other than that, we can't fight. You can't find a Democrat in Kentucky with a flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true in places like Iowa, for example that were very, very competitive states a few years ago. So I think the policies that these, the Democrats, which are a coastal domination party, during, during part of my time, of the four leaders, I was the only one not from New York or California. Today, I bet you all haven't thought about this, but today, the Democrat leader of the Senate and the Democrat leader in the House live in the same neighborhood in Brooklyn. So, I mean, they are an urban, coastal, very, very liberal state. This is a hugely uh, problem for the country. If they ever do get full control of the government, uh, the, the nominee for president on the Democratic side makes the president look moderate, and the president is not moderate at all. So I do worry about the future of the country if they ever get total control of the government. And we need to take the Senate as an insurance policy against what these people will do to the country if they get, to get uh, totally in charge. Sarah, let me ask you one, one last question. And first, thank you so much for being gracious with your time and coming. And as we head into the future, we don't know what the election is going to look like, what the outcome is going to be. But what do you think, beyond just raw electoral politics, what do people in this room need to be thinking about for the future in terms of the policies that you think will set the country on the right path? Well, I think the country is obviously in a, in a bad mood. And I don't think people are likely to respond, unfortunately, to anything other than making arguments against the other side. But I can tell you what I'm pretty confident we would do if we were to get the White House, the House, and the Senate. The first thing I think we would do is to try to extend the Trump tax cuts from 2017 and we'd start filling judges. And I think whoever succeeds me is likely to have complete confidence in at least those two things. The third thing is this border situation is an administrative failure of gargantuan proportions. 
didn't require new legislation to fix it. The previous president didn't get new legislation to fix it, but he did. And so I think we have an obligation to do that and to remind people in order to have the opportunity to do it, the reason we have 40 year inflation is because of a conscious decision the Democrats made in 2021 to dump $2.6 trillion on the economy. And Larry Summers, who some of the old timers in the room might remember, was the Secretary of the Treasury under Bill Clinton, the most prominent liberal economist in the country, former president of Harvard, said at the time, if you do this, you're going to have 40 year inflation. They did, and we do. Not a single Republican voted for that. Senator, you have been extremely gracious with your time, and I'm flattered you would come all the way down to Atlanta to hang out with us. I really appreciate it, and appreciate more than anything that we do not have to say Justice Garland because of you. Thank you so much. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't thank the senator enough for hanging out with us. Um, that was a real treat. And yes, we do not have to say Justice Garland and whatever happens in a few months, we won't have to say Attorney General Garland either, thankfully. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's just hope we can say Attorney General Republican would be fantastic. Um, when Mike Pence was here earlier, Mike Pence also uh, is involved with the group Advanced American Freedom. And I get to hang out with uh, Dominic, I know, you know, from National Review, and also with Matthew Dickerson, who is fantastic on budgeting and spending and get to ask them all sorts of wonderful and tough questions as we hang out and get this panel set up. Uh, and I believe we got one, a third person, I, nobody wrote him down on my agenda, so, but we're gonna have a great conversation about the future of this country. So if I can bring the panel up, I think we're all set. And I'll let y'all all reintroduce yourselves as well. Good to see you. Man. Thanks, man. How are you? Good to see you. All right, so yeah, y'all get the handheld microphones. I get my already drunk bottle of water, so we'll leave this one for me. So first of all, why don't each of you go on and introduce so we know, so the audience knows who's who. I'm Matt Dickerson. I'm the Director of Budget Policy at the Economic Policy Innovation Center, better known as EPIC. I'm John Shelton. I'm the Policy Director for Advancing American Freedom. And I'm Dominic Pino. I'm the Thomas Rhodes Journalism Fellow at National Review. So now, before we begin, I, I got to thank again um, Advancing American Freedom for helping sponsor today uh, and to Vice President Pence as well for coming. But. Let, let's get into the issue that the Senator McConnell and I were talking about on the fiscal side of things with a national debt of 34, 35 trillion dollars. Uh, you were name checked earlier on stage about these issues. So I, as Senator McConnell said, at, at some point we're going to have to do something about it. The question is when uh, and how should we? That's exactly right. Uh, and one of the, the interesting questions you've asked uh, several, several panelists is, is it going to take a crisis? Is it really going to take an inflection point to actually have to act on this? And actually, there's a reason that over the last 40 years, uh, the only actual deficit reduction legislation is, that we've had enacted has been through negotiation around the debt limit. So whether it's a real crisis or something that's something that Congress creates as an inflection point, it really does uh, force Congress to act if we have some sort of deadline or some reason to act. Uh, and so. We're gonna have that inflection point next year. The debt limit is coming back. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of things that we're gonna to have to deal with next year. Um, so we're gonna, hopefully we'll have the opportunity to use the budget reconciliation process to really attack those important priorities. So you, know, you mentioned the, the debt ceiling is, I, I'm in the camp of, well, let's just not raise the debt ceiling and see what happens if we hear the 
doom and gloom scenarios of what might happen if we don't raise the debt ceiling? I mean, what, what would happen in theory if we just said we're not going to raise it? Well, one of the things that would happen is the Congress would basically, or, or the, the Treasury would basically not be able to fund all the things that it's legally required to, to spend its money on because we wouldn't be able to take out more debt. We're running a $2 trillion a year deficit, and so we can't pay for the things that Congress has told the executive branch to go spend its money on. Uh, that would have some pros, but it would have a lot of not, uh, cons too because the U.S. Treasury market is built into the world financial system. Uh, so if you thought 2008 was a bad thing, I think if you did have an actual debt crisis in the United States, I think that would not be the best outcome. The best way to use, to address this problem is use the debt limit as an inflection point, responsibly raise the debt limit, but make sure we're acting, enacting fiscal reforms alongside with it. So John, let me bring, bring you into the conversation. So for those of you who don't know, John and I are on a group chat that I don't think either of us actually intended to be on, but now we can't get out of, it never goes away. And we oftentimes in this group chat have conversations about the impact on families in this country of these things. Um, we're, what is like the debt burden on families now? I mean, in, in any change we make, it seems like more and more families are gonna get penalized. Yeah, Matt or Dom will probably speak more on the, the household breakdown. It's been a while since the yeah. national debt clock, which has the uh, the number on it. It's two hundred sixty-six thousand dollars per American household. Yes. We're adding four and a half million dollars to the national debt every single minute. But you mentioned family, and so on that point, I think the debt conversation which we haven't talked about is that uh, the the debt we're taking out is debt we're taking out on our children, right? So we are funding things that are being paid for by our children. And so it's important to say that that's fundamentally unnatural. We're supposed to pass a blessing along to our children. We're supposed to pass gifts uh, to persons and, and giving them debt is, is to leave them off better than, than, uh, than we have it. So. Uh, every time I see the college tuition bill come in, I leave curses. Um, yes, we, we now have a kid going to college. And I, I do actually worry about that in, in the long term. Uh, we have this feeling now, and I'm going to chime in here, that we're, how do I say this, that, that there is this growing pessimism that it used to be that your children would have a better quality of life in the country than you have, and now I think there's this growing pessimism that our kids aren't going to do that. Yeah, and, and the history of debt and spending is really important, right? Because in the past, when we had big deficits, it was because of some kind of event. So it was because of World War II, for example. Uh, it was because there was a recession. Uh, those are natural things. You're naturally going to have a deficit during a, during a recession. And we can, we can obviously see winning World War II was a good thing to spend money on. Uh, but then, once World War II ends, you have the opportunity to cut back on the spending. And that's what the government did. Once a recession ends, uh, the, the deficit comes back because revenues go up in a, in a better economy and uh, you, you don't have as much need to, to, to spend more to, to stimulate the economy. And we saw it in the Cold War. Soviet Union falls, we have the peace dividend, we ran budget surpluses in the 90s. This time it's different because the reason for our debt is ongoing obligations to entitlement programs and interest payments. And those things are not going to go away. They are determined by actuarial tables, not by the business cycle. And so that's why we're in a different situation now compared to the past where we can't just have uh, an event that caused the deficit uh, you know, to expire and then we can cut back. Now it's uh, a consistent increase because of aging population and because of the promises that the government has made in the laws that's passed. So I, I feel like in all the conversations I'm having and, and the conversations around this, that more and more there's this growing awareness and I, I just, I'm, I'm hung up on the Mitch Daniels op in the Washington Post that do we have to wait for crisis to actually hit before we do something? I mean, what do you guys think? Um, see, we were just talking about how historically uh, people have been warned, politicians have been warned not to touch Social Security and Medicare because it's a third rail that would electrocute you and kill you if you touched it. But the thing about these programs is if you don't touch them, they will also kill you. Uh, and more, maybe, maybe even more certainly kill you because uh, the, the projections, and again, the, the numbers I don't have on the top of my head, but in the next 50 years, if these programs aren't reformed, 
the, the debt will go from $35 trillion to $150 trillion. Yeah, here's, here's the way to think about it. You can put all of federal spending into two buckets. Bucket number one has just four things in it. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and interest payments. That's bucket one. Bucket two is everything else the federal government spends money on. That's all of national defense. That's all the education spending, transportation spending, veterans benefits, law enforcement, national parks, everything, absolutely everything goes in bucket two. Bucket two over the next 30 years, according to the Congressional Budget Office, is gonna add somewhere between $3 trillion and $5 trillion to the debt. That's the imbalance between what it's gonna pay and what it's bringing in. $5 trillion is a lot of money, I don't have to tell any of you that. Bucket one though, over that same 30 years, is gonna add about $120 trillion to the debt. If we're not talking about bucket one, we're not talking about the problem seriously. One thing I'll say is that all the candidates that you're having on stage, if they're running for re-election, they're gonna to have to vote on entitlement reform, whether they want to or not, it's going to come. Uh, and that's simple math, because the Social Security Trust Funds and the Medicare Trust Funds, they're going to be depleted in about 10 years. Uh, one of the interesting things that Leader McConnell said was that you have to do it in a, a bipartisan basis. Well, it's important to have a plan when that negotiation is gonna happen. And there's three pieces of legislation that everybody should know about, because the Democrats are grasping this third rail hard. Uh, Medicare for All Act, the Social Security Expansion Act, and the Social Security 2100 Act. These are all crazy Democrat bills that would massively increase taxes and then massively actually increase spending on these unsustainable entitlement programs. They all have more than 100 co-sponsors in the House and dozens of co-sponsors in the Senate. And Republicans have no plan for when these negotiations are going to have to happen. So what, is, what does the plan look like for the right? What should we be doing? I mean, I think we could start by not uh, running away from this. Or, you know, you saw the, the party platform for the first time in, in 40 years. They, they eliminated any, any kind of talk about debt, any kind of talk about adopting a balanced budget amendment. Um, and in the, insofar that this problem is a, a problem of willpower, which I think uh, Senator McConnell is right to describe it, uh, there, there are a lot of good ideas out there. Uh, Epic has many of them, AEM's got, got hits too. Uh, it, it's a willpower problem, and there's nothing more dispiriting than, than saying we're not going to do anything to address this problem whatsoever. And, and that's what happened this year, unfortunately. So now, let me put you on the spot on this one, because you write at National Review and you talk to a lot of people. Um, and obviously, not dealing with the stuff off the record, but are, what are the whispers that Republicans and conservatives say on this stuff when, when you cover it and write about it, the, the concerns or the direction they want to go? Because I do oftentimes think that everyone understands the concerns, but there's like not as we're discussing any sort of plan. I think a lot of them are afraid um, uh, because of, uh, and I think what John said is, is really good, that it's a third rail whether you want to touch it or not, right? Uh, and so um, uh, I think a lot of them are afraid of that, but I do think you're right that if you talk to them behind closed doors, I think a lot of people will say uh, that they understand that this is a problem, um, but they don't always know how to fix it. Um, one Republican that has been uh, putting forward actual proposals on this issue has been Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana. Um, he has ideas about Social Security. He has been uh, going out and talking about those uh, with voters and found that they actually are pretty open to it. Um, and so, uh, and so he's one he's one guy that's that's leading on that. And uh, uh, so so it's not like nobody's doing it. It's not like there aren't any ideas. And you know you can go to any number of different think tanks in Washington D.C. They all have a white paper on how to solve this problem, right? And you know the answer is probably not one of them. It's probably some combination of ideas from a lot of them. And that's, that's, how, that's how good policy gets made. Another thing we can do is we can learn from other countries' experience, because obviously the United States isn't the only country that has this problem. Other countries have had it before us. And we can look at places like Canada, places like Ireland, places like Sweden, places that had huge social welfare, social welfare states, um, and they hit the point that Margaret Thatcher talked about where they ran out of other people's money. And so what they had to do, all of them, and they've been pretty successful on this, and, you know, this was a couple decades ago for, for most of them. Uh, what they had to do was they had to cut spending. There were some modest tax increases, 
but you cannot tax your way out of this problem. They had to cut spending. And the only countries that were able to do this successfully are countries that cut spending and have and had cross-political, cross-partisan agreement. And I can't say bipartisan because some of these countries have more than two parties. But um, you know, they had to have buy-in from across the political spectrum because that's what reassures borrowers on the bond market that if the other side wins the election, it's not just going to get overturned and then your money's going to be gone. That's a good point, the, the stability and consistency. One of the, the issues that comes up all the time, and I'm just totally spitballing this with you, because I hear it when you get in groups of conservatives say, we have the BRAC Commission for the military, shouldn't we do something like that for spending and entitlement? I mean, is, is that even in the conversation of maybe if Congress doesn't want to vote on this stuff, they'll outsource it to somebody to do it for them so they can say it wasn't us? I'll take this one. Uh, I think the people have floated the idea of kind of outsourcing it. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about different types of fiscal commissions, and every single member of Congress that I've talked to over the last year hates the BRAC idea. They want ownership. They, they're the ones with the election certificates. They're the ones that want to make the hard decisions. Well, and concurrently with this, I don't know anyone my age or younger who actually thinks Social Security is going to be around. Uh, by the time they get to it. So isn't that a good way to start the conversation with people maybe to start having this that we want to preserve it as opposed to the Democrats just blowing it up? Yeah, I, I think that is. And it is it is a, a generational thing, right? I think I think you're right that nobody, nobody certainly nobody my age thinks that it's, it's, it's coming uh, for them. And so we're making our own plans um, about how we're going to uh, how we're going to be in, in retirement. And uh, one of the things as well is talking about it in terms of ownership, I think is helpful because, you know, uh, politicians like to talk about Social Security as though you are like putting your money into a little account for you that you get back later. And that's not how it works. The money has already been spent before you even paid in. OK, so uh, talking about it in terms of ownership and in terms of the retirement accounts that people have with most employers. Uh, where you actually do have ownership of the money that you contribute. Uh, uh, ideas about, about ownership and about making sure that you actually have a stake in that future and that, uh, it, and that the money's not just being uh, taken from you and given to other people. I think that's a, another effective way to talk about this, especially with younger people who, like you said, are not counting on this program being around anyway. In the year 2024, what do we do exactly the same way that we did 90 years ago? Right. Uh, so instead of having a, a very old system that uh, locks people into a kind of one size fits all program, why don't we sell something that's actually a winning message that is choice and ownership and freedom and make we could actually make Social Security work like people think it does. Uh, and, and I think and you actually get a better deal if you do that for seniors and taxpayers. Yeah, to talk about just how different it is, Social Security was a bargain for the federal government 90 years ago. It was a, it was a good financial decision for the federal government. Uh, that's how far removed we are from the origins of that, origins of that program. So I, I had a random personal question for each of you. How on earth did each of you get to where you are, where you're sitting on a stage with me talking about the national debt, as opposed to all the other many things in this country you could potentially be doing with your lives? Uh, so I'm, I'm from a little place called Louisa County, Virginia, which is right in the middle of, of Virginia. And that's where a lot of our founders are from. Uh, it's, it's James Madison's congressional district. It's, uh, it, was, it was Patrick Henry's House of Burgesses district. And so I grew up around history, and so I knew I always wanted to do something in D.C. I was lucky enough to get work uh, in a member of Congress's office. I spent five years with the staff of the Republican Study Committee. I spent a couple years at outside organizations like uh, ran the Budget Center at the, the Heritage Foundation uh, and worked at the House Budget Committee and, and lucky enough to, to be here and, and work on some really interesting issues and try to help save the country. I, I just, it, 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 again, it, your name comes up every time there's a budget issue. It's like, oh, I, I know this guy and it's always you. You're like the budget guy. It's a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> a lot of fun. <laughs> it's, it's, the budget it's interesting. fun. John, how did you get to do it? I wouldn't uh, recommend it as for anyone as a, as a path. Um, the the nicer answer is that my granddad was the running mate of President Reagan in 1976 when he lost. Um, but the real answer is a very weird one. I went to divinity school and then I went to Congress and uh, eventually ended up working with uh, former Vice President Pence. So it's uh, 
It, it's kind of like shoots and ladders uh, versus nets. <laughs> Well, I, I grew up in Wisconsin and um, uh, love it there. And uh, one of the first issues that got me interested in politics was all of the protests in Wisconsin over Scott Walker's Act 10 and all of the public sector union problems and all of that. Uh, you know, I was still in school at the time, obviously, so I had like teachers who like called out sick to go, you know, protest at the Capitol or whatever. And I was just like, this is ridiculous. Um, and so. Uh, uh, you know, that was, that was sort of my, my entry point to politics and, you know, my dad listened to a lot of talk radio, uh, at that time. And so, uh, uh so that, that, that was part of it as well. But then I started reading National Review in, in high school and, uh, read it a lot in high school, probably too much. But, uh, as a result of that, I really wanted to work there and, uh, I got involved with the, uh, campus newspaper at my college. I went to George Mason University, studied economics there and then applied for the NR internship three times. I got it on the third time, and uh, I've been there ever since. All of us who start reading National Review from an early age wind up on this weird path of politics. Yes, yeah, so I grew up overseas, and, and the my parents subscribed to Southern Living and National Review, and so- That's all you need, that's all you need, really. really. <laughs> the comics of National Review, yes, it is all you need. Indoctrinated by William F. Buckley, I learned big words at an early age, yes. So, okay, so let, let, let's wind this home then, because you all have a passion clearly for what you're doing. You're all focused on this, um, but this seems to be the looming issue we keep hearing about. There is a fiscal cliff. Our debt is increasingly above GDP. I talked to a member of the Federal Reserve who said, one of the things we have to remember is that if we can grow the denominator, we're never gonna cut the numerator easily grow the denominator, which means we've got to stimulate a, a lot of economic growth in this country, which as the Code of Federal Relations grows, the ability to grow the economy shrinks. So is there any optimism here for our path forward from each other? I think so. Uh, we're, we're, we have the, uh, the, the 2024 Olympics this year, but at, next year, 2025, is really going to be the, the debt Olympics. There's a massive fiscal cliff coming. We have to deal with the expiration of the tax cuts. The debt limit is going to be reinstated on uh, January 1st. Uh, four days into the next presidency, they got to deal with something called statutory PAYGO, where there's automatic spending cuts uh, that, that, that President Trump may not want to have to deal with. Uh, the, the discretionary spending limits are going to expire, and there's got to be a new negotiation on how much we're going to spend next year. Uh, and all at the same time, our fiscal situation, our fiscal space is going to be continuing to, to deteriorate. Uh, but we do have a great opportunity to use the budget reconciliation process where you can pass stuff through the House, pass it through the Senate, get President Trump to sign it into law, uh, where we can deal with things like securing the border, we can deal with inflation, we can preserve the, the tax cuts, we can get people back into the workforce, make work pay again, and we can work on draining the swamp. And so I think it's a big challenge, but I think it's an amazing opportunity next year. I'm a bit more of a dour German American by disposition. <laughs> and, uh, so I'll start with pessimism, which is that the last time we paid off the debt was two centuries ago under President Jackson. Last time we paid down the debt, so just chipped away at it, was, was uh, nearly a century ago under President Coolidge. Uh, the, the, uh, we, there will be opportunities coming up, and that's very, very, very good. Uh, the, the cause for optimism is also maybe kind of pessimistic, which is that the closer we get to insolvency of these trust funds that, that hold up Social Security and Medicare, uh, the more clear it will become that we need to do this. Uh, but at the same time, it will become more clear because it will become uh, more dire, more difficult to do. If we had tackled this in the 2000s when people were laughing at George Bush for uh, you know, suggesting we should do private Social Security accounts, it would have been a lot easier. We have a lot less of a, a runway to get the plane off the ground uh, before it crashes. And I'm just a big believer in the bond market. So uh, eventually, uh, uh, people are going to stop uh, trusting that the federal government is going to pay them back. Uh, we've seen this a little bit with uh, higher yields on bonds uh, in, the, in the last couple of years. We've seen it with uh, credit downgrades from uh, the rating agencies, and uh, eventually, that's going to that's going to reach uh, another uh, you know a, a point where uh, federal spending becomes even more unsustainable than it already is and politicians will have to do something. Um, the important thing is to have ideas on the shelf 
for when that time comes. And so that's why, you know, really important work that a lot of people are doing right now to make sure that we actually have uh, the ideas ready to go because we do not want to be caught by surprise. This is the most predictable political problem that we have. Lots of other things are unpredictable, wars, recessions, all of that. This is really predictable. We know this is coming and we need to be ready. Well, I'd like to apologize to the audience that we didn't actually arrange it and not put you in the middle so we can have the optimist to the pessimist. And, and the scale here is to have the optimist and pessimist right next to each other. But it works and the conversations we have to have. Again, thank you guys for the sponsorship and, and for being here as well and, and for having the conversation. It gives us a lot to think about, but as Mitch McConnell says, at some point it's going to be dealt with. We just don't know when. So thank you very much. Thank you. You know, I, I think they're all right that at some point we're going to deal with the issue, whether we want to deal with the issue or not. The question is, do we have a plan in place before we get to that time? So I want to thank the panelists for coming uh, for the sponsorship as well to be able to make this possible. Now, I've been looking forward to this because, as I mentioned, so my radio show is growing, and I picked up Sacramento and picked up uh, Stanton, Virginia. We just picked up Oklahoma City, I think, two weeks ago, and I moved from being like midnight to 2 a.m. to 11 to 2 p. 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. live in Tulsa, Oklahoma, on KRMG a couple weeks ago. So this, this, one of the selfish reasons I wanted to have Congressman Hurd here is this district. But I also want to have the governor of the state of Oklahoma here as well. One, because we keep having all these teams that just keep getting added to the SEC that aren't actually in the Southeast. Um, and I, I, got a, I got a question this. It's just very, very odd. Like, pretty soon we're going to have like Oregon and the SEC and like, change our name to something else. But also, I've like got a, this new appreciation for Oklahoma now that I keep winding up all these radio stations out there and have a large audience. Uh, and we've got people from Oklahoma here in the room. It's like, might as well have folks from Oklahoma come, including the governor of the state of Oklahoma, who is a businessman, a popular governor, just got reelected, uh, went through this, this wild reelection campaign where the Democrats, for some reason, got into their head like, it's like Kansas. We can get a Democrat in Oklahoma. No can't get a Democrat in Oklahoma. But also, one of the fascinating things to me is I actually am a Neil Gorsuch fan, but also Neil Gorsuch seems to have this bone to pick with Oklahoma on the rights of the, the tribal rights and things. And so I've been looking forward to having this conversation with the governor of the fantastic state of Oklahoma, Kevin Stead. Texas, because I know there's this rivalry there. <laughs> well, first of all, thanks so much for having me. Um, first, Oklahoma is a step above Texas. Okay? <laughs> uh, but no, we, we've got a great rivalry with Oklahoma, uh, or with Texas, and uh, we certainly beat them in football, so. There you go, yes. Uh, and, and weirdly, everybody comes to the SEC. It's, 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 it's an odd thing to me. Um, so let me ask you this out of the gate, because I actually went back. I, I rarely like sit down and do deep dive research and things on uh, before I do interviews like this. But I wanted to go back and read Neil Gorsuch's decision on tribal rights in Oklahoma. And it seems like your state, as opposed to the other 49, does have this situation now where you are a sovereign state within the American federal system, but also a sovereign state separate from the United States with Indian treaties. And how do you as the governor now navigate the tribal relations? Well, th thanks for asking about that. And this is something I think that the audience, you guys are, it's just a fascinating uh, situation that we find ourselves in. I, I tell people this is the biggest issue that's ever hit a state since maybe the Civil War. And I think after I explain it to you, you'll see why we're, we're struggling with it so hard. First off, I'm a Cherokee Indian, okay? Uh, I have my tribal card. Most Indians in Oklahoma, this is what people don't realize, they look like me. They look like my six kids. So all this money that's 
pouring in the quote unquote indigenous people. It's just silly. It's dumb. We don't need to do that anymore. And so we've got, I want to explain the difference between Oklahoma and a true reservation. Okay, so the Navajo reservation is a true reservation. That's out in Arizona. And I've talked to Ducey, I've talked to their, their, uh, their governor. Um, okay, so the Navajo reservation is land held in reserve for the tribes. All of it is common land, okay? And so yes, it's true that an Indian that lives on that reservation doesn't pay taxes to the state of Arizona. 100% true. But what's also true is the state of Arizona doesn't build roads or bridges or schools or hospitals on that reservation. It's truly land set aside in reserve for that tribe. Okay, now back to Oklahoma. We became a state in 1907. And at statehood, we used to have reservations, but we disbanded those at statehood. We allotted out all of our land, 160 acres at a time. They did away with the court system. We became one state until 2020. And Gorsuch ruled in this McGirt situation, which McGirt is a bad guy. He was prosecuted by the state of Oklahoma. He raped a four-year-old, was sentenced to prison. And then his defense attorneys came up with this idea that he shouldn't have been tried because he was an Indian on Indian reservation. So Gorsuch said that now 42% of our state was at a reservation. So that means Tulsa, Oklahoma, with a million people, is a reservation. So what are the consequences? Well, now they're saying that they don't have to pay taxes to the state of Oklahoma. All right. So think about this. Kevin Stitt, uh, a doctor, a lawyer, whatever, a businessman in Tulsa, Oklahoma, doesn't pay taxes to the state, but a single mom of another race has to. And our kids all go to the same high school. We drive on the same roads. We have the same benefits. They're arguing that the Tulsa Police Department doesn't have the authority to issue an Indian speeding tickets, speeding through Tulsa. I mean, it's just preposterous. It's created two systems of justice that I'm fighting uh, just everywhere I turn around. And, and, and most people don't realize the consequences on the ground to our, our district attorneys, our prosecutors. They've lost the ability to protect and prosecute crimes when, a Nate, when an Indian is involved in the crime. And so that's why I, I say it's such a huge issue uh, that we have to deal with. And unfortunately, Congress has not had the appetite uh, to, to, to do the magic words that Gorsuch mentioned in that, that deal, uh, that the, the McGirt decision that said that they need to disestablish the reservations in the state of Oklahoma. So that's basically a quick overview of what's happened in the state. It, 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 honestly, it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm a fan of the justice and, and I understand his reasoning. He was disagree with it, but it's kind of just, you've probably got the most complicated gubernatorial position in the whole country I've been in. I, I, absolutely. I mean, there's a Strobel case right now before the Supreme Court on taxes. Do they pay taxes? And remember, I say they, we're all Oklahomans. This is the, I mean, uh, we, we all go to the same public schools. And so to say us versus them, it's just, it's never been that way in the state of Oklahoma. Um, so hopefully we get this thing, uh, we get this settled. And I think most Oklahomans agree with me that uh, we need to have one set of rules regardless of your race. We can't have a situation where uh, there's certain punishment for this crime, for, for this race, and then Indians have a, different, have a different punishment. And again, when I say Indians, I say that in the fact that people need to understand uh, remember, Indians are me, my six kids with blonde hair and blue eyes. That's the way uh, Native Americans are in the state of Oklahoma. Now, when I was growing up as a kid, my dad worked for Conoco Oil, and I grew up understanding that there was the state called Oklahoma with this place called Pocket City, and that oil came out of the ground, much like Texas, but it was different. Energy is this massive issue for your state, and I gotta imagine that, like, you feel at war with the federal government right now constantly because of their energy regulations. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, first off, I think most Americans, they, they understand that we have to have an affordable, reliable energy grid. I think it's a national security issue. I think energy independence is so important for not only the United States, but also our allies around the world. And Oklahoma's story is, is amazing. I mean, we're, we're number six in oil production, uh, number five in natural gas production. But what people don't realize, we're also number three in electricity generated by wind. Okay. We have uh, some of the cleanest water, cleanest air in the country. We're one of only four states that over 45% of our energy comes from renewables. 
So we have this all of the above approach, and we just think it's unbelievable that the Biden-Harris administration is, is trying to tell us that you can't have this gas stove or you can't do LNG exports, which, by the way, hurts our European allies, it hurts Japan, it hurts all of our allies because they have to have reliable energy in their countries, and it just forces them to, um, you know, our adversaries, really, quite frankly. Um, and so we don't understand the, the war on just American companies and American energy and, and, uh, and all of the above approach is kind of the way we say it in the state of Oklahoma. Yeah. How is the border crisis and, and the, just the, this wave of legal immigrants, how is it affecting Oklahoma? You know, I mean, you've heard it said before that every state is a, is a border state, and, it, and it's so true um, that what happens on the border in Texas, uh, the drug trade, it's, it's, it's you know, coming into Oklahoma. I mean, fentanyl deaths are up about 500% in the state since I took over as governor. Um, but the Republican governors have been pushing back. We've been standing with Governor Abbott. We've sent letters to President Biden. We've all sent troops down to the southern border. Um, and, and it's just, it's unbelievable to us how you can have an administration that refuses to have a strong border, right? We just, it just doesn't make sense. Um, unless you think that you can turn those into voters and it's going to help you in your next election. That's the only possible rational explanation to, that the Democrats have in this situation. Um, but when, I've been down there, and one policy change, which would cost the American people nothing, uh, and I've talked to the border, uh, the people on the border, the border security, and they tell me it's, it's simply the Trump policy of remain in Mexico. Okay? That's all it is. It's we're going to keep, we're going to make sure you stay in Mexico until your court date. And Biden canceled that day one in office. And so now uh, they get a sheet of paper that says, come back in a couple of years, come on in and enjoy all the services of the state of Oklahoma or the citizens of uh, the United States of America. And, and how stupid are we that we have all of these services, whether it's healthcare or housing, you know, it's the benefit of the U.S. citizens and it's a safety net uh, for the less fortunate. We can't afford to do that and have open borders and, and have have all these people coming in uh, taking advantage of uh, the taxpayers in the U.S. Now, under the Democrats' logic, as I'm learning, seeing or talking to you, they can come to Oklahoma, identify as Native American, and I mean, they don't even have to pay taxes or do anything. It's remarkable, just identify as it. Um, in addition to energy and border issues in Oklahoma, it, I just, I, I, we have a mutual friend, and, and I, I, I know your pollster, and he, we were laughing before your last re-election that it just, it, 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 it kind of sailed under the, the national radar, but there were so many stories of just, the Democrats had you in, in you were going to be beaten, and there were Democratic polls that the media ran with, and it was just kind of the epitome of how the national media, like they do with Texas every year, that, oh my gosh, it's, it's suddenly the state is going to flip. Uh, I, I, when we had uh, Congressman Hernia earlier, he mentioned that you can't find a Democrat in the state of Oklahoma, and yet it, there's always seems to be this massive news story about these states. And so I wanted to talk to you more about national politics, but as it applies to Oklahoma, just your experience in your race with you being a Republican governor in a state that it's not a swing state, and yet the national media like wanted to savage you as a governor with a great record just because some Democratic polling firm could produce a crank poll and say, oh, we can get this guy. I mean, I mean, you said it very well. I mean, the, nobody's believing these polls anymore. It's, it's who's, who's paying for them, um, who, who, what, what agenda are they trying to push? And so, yeah, they, they were showing a really tight race. Uh, I ended up winning by more than I did the first time. Uh, so one by 15 points. Uh, but it's really disappointing that, that our news media is uh, kind of tries to push that narrative. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's frustrating not only for Oklahomans, but I think Americans in general. Now, on those issues, in, in, I mean, all politics is local. We can talk about the border, we can talk about the economy, we can talk about energy, but uh, every day in Oklahoma, in addition to the tribal situation you're dealing with, what really is, if you wanted Americans to know, here really are the local issues for Oklahoma that you as governor have to deal with that may be unique to your state. What else do you have to deal with? Well, as a, as a businessman, I've never been in office until I ran in 2018. I, I started a company with $1,000 in a computer and grown it and, and uh, had over 1,000 employees. And, and, uh, and then just felt called to, I think Trump inspired, inspired me a little bit. And, and I just felt called to go serve my state. And I tell people, I think that's what our founding fathers envisioned, is that you would be a successful teacher or rancher or business person, and you'd leave that to go serve your state or your, 
your country and then go back to the private sector. And when you do that, uh, you literally can focus on the next generation and not the next election. Too many times politicians are always focused on, uh, you, know, you know, stepping up the ladder, or what, what's the next thing for me or how, and I just think that's the wrong approach to take. And so I promised Oklahomans I was gonna run Oklahoma like a business. And so that's, that's been my approach. Oklahoma is the most business friendly state in the country right now. Uh, I took over and we had no money in savings. We were having billion dollar budget deficits. We were having teacher walkouts. And today we put more money in education than any other governor in my first five years than they did for 25 years before I got here. Um, we're running an efficient government. I've cut taxes, I've cut income, I've cut the corporate, I've cut the individual, I've cut grocery tax, which was most, the most regressive tax that we had. Because I'm, government is not the answer, okay? I've been on the inside. And more government is not the answer. I love how Ronald Reagan said it. Most of the time, government is the problem. And that's why I believe in limited government. Um, and so those are one of the big things we're doing. The other thing is when I talk to businesses and I have an international strategy where I'm recruiting, uh, I've met with probably 60 ambassadors, recruiting companies to come to Oklahoma. They love our energy. They love our affordable energy. We're leading the country in that. Um, but more than, more than anything, um, it's all about workforce, and so I want to touch real quick on education as well, uh, because I think at the end of the day, whether you're Republican or Democrat, uh, when we get elected to these positions like governor, I tell people that you know we really all want the same thing. We want the best education for our kids. We want the best infrastructure. We want the best uh, you know roads and bridges, infrastructure, healthcare, and then the best economy. And so those are the things I always focus on. And uh, when I think about education. This is something that I think most people would agree with me, is uh, you know during COVID, it really exposed what was happening in education. And if any of you were governors, and you had to talk to the single moms and single dads during that time period, and we, most of our schools were open, but we had a couple inner city schools that were closed. And I hammered them every day to open because the, the people would call me and they would say, Governor, what am I supposed to do? My first grader is not learning how to read on Zoom right now. And I have to go to work during the day. And it just would break your heart. Um, and so we passed the best school choice plan, I think, in the country. Other Texas now is, is looking at our plan, trying to get it across the finish line. And I always tell people uh, this, rich people already have school choice. Uh, they can put their kids in any school they want. And so we passed a refundable tax credit that every family now in Oklahoma has up to $7,500 to take their kid to any school that they, that they want to. And I just think that's gonna be a game. Now, the issue of economy is a very dangerous thing for a governor to come to Georgia and to try to claim to be like the best state for business. I mean, have you seen the Kip shotgun ads? This is a, this is a dangerous man. <laughs> I just talked to somebody that moved from Georgia to Oklahoma and their taxes went down. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are fighting words around here. Yeah, it's still on the, the, the football field. Um, how do you actually balance your relationship with other, because you know, we've got the National Gubernatorial Association, but as these institutions go, and I always seem like the, the, the bipartisan ones actually drift to the left, but you've also got the RGA. How do, how do you balance your relationships with the other governors? You know, very collegial, and uh, we get along and, and share ideas with each other. Uh, like when, when the border crisis, it, it's really, I, I, I feel like Congress is so dysfunctional that really the ideas are coming from the governors. And so we put, we've put come together on the LNG pods to send letters to, to President Biden to say, this is just unbelievable. How in the world can you harm our domestic companies and also our, hurt our allies that rely on our natural gas here in America uh, and we need you to reverse that. Uh, we stood with, uh, with Abbott on border policies and we got this national conversation going on. Um, so school choice, we're helping our friends and Kim Reynolds in Iowa got school choice done and, and Ducey in Arizona was kind of a guy that I looked up to. Jeb Bush in Florida 20 years ago has been coaching me on some of the things they did in education. So it's really a, a time that we can learn from each other. And you know, the, the United States of America, we have 50 different laboratories of democracy. And as a business guy, uh, I have my staff, we put together um, you know, my, my metrics and I track everything. And I have a realistic look. 
where is Oklahoma compared to every other state? And then where do we need to be to be 25th? And where do we need to be in the top 10? And I'll tell you one thing that uh, when I took over, we were last place in incarceration room. So in other words, we incarcerated more men and women than any other state. I was like, well, this is stupid. We're, our people aren't worse than any other state. So I started looking at the policies and realized that we need to change some things. And now I've closed four prisons, two private prisons. I've saved hundreds of millions of dollars to the taxpayer. And we're number two in the lowest recidivism rate right now uh, in the country. And so we're, do, we're doing some things because I just try to look at those stats and if Texas is doing something better than me or Arizona or, or California, well, California's not doing anything better than us. <laughs> but uh, actually, the state, we're top 10 in people moving to Oklahoma right now, uh, per capita, not, not per capita, but true numbers, we're top 10 right now. And the state we get most people from is California, if you believe that. Uh, and I'll meet these people from California and they'll come up to me and at events and governor, can we get a picture? We just moved to California. I'm like, absolutely, but here's the deal. I had to wait 18 years to vote in the state of Oklahoma. I'm gonna make you wait 18 years. So, so, the reason I like having these conversations like this is inevitably you say something that then, then triggers something in my brain that if I prescripted, I must ask these five questions I wouldn't get to. The recidivism rate in, in prison, how much of that is mental health? Um, and what you deal with as a governor being mental health issues in your state population? You know, there, there is definitely a, uh, a portion of that is mental health, but some of the other things that I found is, uh, uh, you know, during, during, I ended up doing the largest commutation in U.S. history when I first came into office, so uh, November of 2019. And I realized most politicians wait till the end of their term. I didn't realize I was supposed to do that. Uh, because uh, we, it's complicated, we passed some law that the people that I let out weren't even, wouldn't be if they committed that uh, drug crime today. It was m very small, minor drug crimes. We, we let those folks out. But I realized they didn't have a driver's license when they get out. They didn't know how to get an education or a job. And so we passed the Sarah Stitt Act, which was my wife's idea, which, gentlemen, you get a lot of kudos from your wife when you pass a bill and you name it after your wife. <laughs> Uh, but basically, some of those things we saw were just kind of stacked up on people. People were getting out of prison with ten, twenty thousand dollars worth of fines, fees, and court costs, and that was super hard for most people to get past. So I tried to reduce that. It wasn't it wasn't restitution dollars either. It was the way that we were funding our court system. So I changed all those those rules, and just there was a perverse incentive. In other words, our judges were paying for their retirement from fines, fees, and court costs. So I changed that. I was like, well, that's dumb. Uh, I said, I go, let's have the legislature appropriate the money to the court system so they're not incentivized to get that money from fines, fees, and court costs. And so, and then also just making sure that people can get jobs right when they get out. Uh, you know, and so th those are kind of the things we're seeing. We're number two in recidivism rates, so and we're doing something right because the people aren't going back into prison. And uh, so we're gonna keep moving up that ranking, which which is normally not a Republican deal you talk about, but as a business guy, I look at all these metrics, and if my state is last place in something, just like in business, we're like, if they can do it, we can do it, right? Uh, we're number seven right now, number five right now in uh, bridge conditions in the country. I look at hotels sold, I look at per capita income, we look at teacher pay uh, on, a, on a metric between other states. You have to play what market is. I love our teachers. I want to make sure that we have, we support them. Um, so that's kind of how I think about stuff. It's more from a business standpoint. So you mentioned this, you mentioned hotels. I, I find it what, like, I really thought I was reading a fake news story, but it's true that someone wants to build the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere in Oklahoma City. This, that, that kind of blew my mind that what sets Oklahoma City apart that someone would want to build the tallest building in Oklahoma is where the puck is heading. I mean, this is just, everybody knows this, right? Uh, it, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. The quality of life, uh, there's an arbitrage right now on labor cost, on cost of living. We're like 400% cheaper than they are in California. Uh, it's where manufacturing is coming to. Uh, my international strategy, when I talk to a European company that wants a U.S. presence, well, Oklahoma is the right spot to be located for distribution purposes, for cost of living, uh, for energy reliability. I, I, let me interrupt you there because I just think on the map, you guys, I, I think it was Brian Kim was mentioned earlier that Georgia's two days at most from the 48 states. You've got to be like a day in any direction 
logistically to be able to. That's right. Uh, I mean, we're dead center right there in the middle of the U.S., so we're a thousand nautical miles from, from anyone if you're pilots in the room. Uh, and then, and then most people don't know this, we also have uh, shipping all the way. The most inland port comes right outside of Tulsa. Uh, so we have shipping, all of the, all of the uh, fertilizers will come up through the shipping, all to be distributed to Kansas, Oklahoma, Iowa, Nebraska. All the grain has came, come back through there. Um, the pipeline capital of the world. So, so Cushing, Oklahoma is the largest oil, oil commercial reserve in the country. We've got 100 million barrels. Actually, West Texas crude, West Texas Intermediate, WTI, is priced not from West Texas, from Cushing, Oklahoma. When you get a barrel of oil to Cushing, Oklahoma, that's where the price is, uh, is priced off of. Uh, for everybody in this audience, this is something I love explaining to people. There's two pipelines from Canada to Cushing, Oklahoma. Okay, one of them is called the Keystone. The Keystone XL was going to be the third pipeline. Did you know that? The Keystone XL was going to be the third pipeline from Canada to uh, Cushing, Oklahoma, that gets all political and then the uh, Biden cancels it and all the stuff that goes on. We know the safest way to move oil and natural gas is by pipeline. Uh, but who are the lobbyists that get in and kill it? The trucking companies, maybe the maybe uh, BNSF, the railroads, and, and all the people that think they're going to lose some of their uh, uh, some of their revenue. So it always comes back to money on what's happening on, on, on these on these uh, political issues. So transitioning from business into what statewide office, what's the biggest surprise to you from going from the private sector as businessman into being the governor of Oklahoma? You know, I mean, well, first off, as the, you know, a lot of business people in the, in the audience, and I had to bootstrap everything, and I started with $1,000 in a computer and grew my company, and uh, as CEO, you, you get your team around you, and, and you make the right decision for the company, and, and, you, and you move forward. In politics, it's like being in business with, you know, the legislature, which is 150 of your craziest uncles. And, uh, it's just very, very odd. Uh, the other thing I explain to people is, and what, think about this for a second. In business, let's say your business makes a million dollars this year, okay? So in 2024, we make a million dollars, and we sit around at the end of the year, and we're planning for 2025. Nobody in business thinks to themselves, okay, well, how can we raise expenses a million dollars, okay? And let's spend that whole million dollars we just made, raise all the base level expenses, and so we go into 25 and zero. That's what government does every single year, okay? It's worse than that, because the federal side, they're spending, and I, and I, I loved your panel before, because they're spending about $2 trillion over our revenue or over our income. Y'all hear me on that? It is, it's unsustainable on a national level. Um, and, and so our interest only cost is now a trillion dollars, which is gonna be, more than we spend on the national debt. It is, a, it is a cliff that we're facing. And I, I explain it to people this way. When I bought my first house, uh, after I graduated from college, uh, I spent $66,000, bought my first house at 8th and Harvard, right across from TU in Tulsa. And I remember making my mortgage payment, and it was about, my mortgage payment was $550, and only $49 went towards principal. And I was like, oh my gosh, only $49 went towards principal. <laughs> But at least I knew in 30 years I was going to own my house. Well, we don't pay interest and principal on our national debt. It means we'll never pay it off. It's interest only. And we keep spending $2 trillion more every year that just keeps building up. We're already at 25% of our interest payments. And as soon as the bonds reprice, okay, and, and the finance guys know this, it's going to be about 45% of our income that we're spending on interest only. So we're, those will start to reprice. And it's just, uh, I, I think we need to have, and, and Republicans and Democrats both have to have an honest conversation and national about this. Last question for you, transitioning again from private to public sector, being in the spotlight, how do you balance your family and the public and their transition also into a public life that maybe they didn't expect to have? Yeah, I mean, it's been, uh, so, uh, I have six children, been married for 26 years, so our kids go from 23 down to 10. And uh, my oldest was a senior in high school when I won, my youngest was four. And um, 
So here was the difference. I tried to get my oldest daughter. I said, Listen, you know, you ought to go to college in Oklahoma, look at Oklahoma State or OU. And she was like, Dad, I don't want anybody to know I'm, I'm the governor's daughter. I'm going out of state. I said, okay. So she ended up going to Baylor and graduate. She's in, she's in law school now. My next boy, my next son, he was like, you're crazy, Natalie. I'm not going anywhere but OU or OSU. Dad's the governor. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's the difference between the kids. Um, but we had to move from Tulsa. All they knew was one school, and we were there and established. And I moved to Oklahoma City, and, and uh, so it was a struggle. I had a couple that were teenagers, and and then the younger ones are, are, are fine. But there's a couple that uh, that struggled with that transition a little bit. But you know, I believe you have to keep your priorities right. Right? You have to put God first, then your family, and then your job. And so I'm a, I'm a father. I've got an important job to do, and just like all of us. Uh, but we can't get our priorities out of whack because I'm a father first. I'm a husband, my wife, and I'm going to be that long after I get through uh, with governor. And, and I'm just trying to I'm trying to leave my state top ten. I tell people my vision is Oklahoma to be a top ten state and uh, to be the best state for business. And I believe if we do that, um, everything else takes care of itself. Um, you know, our education system, everything. I just set up business courts in Oklahoma which I'd love to talk about. That's, a, that's something that I think is really important. So business course just for, so very much like Delaware as a chancery system? Correct. I saw, I saw you know, Delaware starting to stumble, but most businesses know that, that most, uh, most of your Fortune 500 companies are, are domiciled or they put their, their uh, you know, Delaware law, they incorporated Delaware. Elon just pulled out of Delaware. You saw them starting to get involved with compensation. You saw what happened to President Trump's businesses that are attacking him in New York. And so I want businesses to know that uh, Oklahoma is the most business-friendly state. So we set up chancery courts or business courts so the business is sued or uh, the headquarters uh, or the board members are sued. Um, you're going to have business judges. Um, I got rid I'm getting rid of the, the corporate income tax. Uh, so we're really just trying to be the most business-friendly state in the country. Well, I plan on coming to see you, and now that I'm on in Tulsa, Oklahoma City, I've got an excuse to come out there because I've only made a pit stop in Oklahoma City to refuel in a plane one time, but now I've got an excuse. I gotta come. So Love I also it. have heard that I can't get elected in Oklahoma because my name's not Kevin, and you apparently have to. So thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate you making the trip out here, and I look forward to getting to Oklahoma. My, my pleasure. Thank you all so much. <laughs>
crisis, which I'm happy to talk about in a little bit. Um, and, and, and those really kind of misguided priorities have translated into a lot of failed policies. I mean, we saw the really disastrous uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan, the withdrawal of Kabul. Uh, a lot of veterans who are part of Veterans Duty were uh, our Afghanistan veterans who fought there, and it was extremely painful to see. And of course, that results in, in, in uh, 13 service members being killed in action. Um, it, it did not have to be that way. Um, and it's only gotten worse. And so we, we sprung into action, started writing op-eds, going and engaging in news media, um, and really just advocating for policies that we think will make a, make a significant difference so we don't see just a, a, this domino effect that's been happening over the last several years from, uh, the, from the invasion of Ukraine to the banning of our ally Israel. And it's been a mess. And so that's what we're all about. And so I'm just proud to be part of such an organization that cares about this. So it, it, you mentioned recruitment, but it, I got to imagine that morale between the people who are active duty is, is suffering under what they're seeing with the policy of the administration. And not just morale, but you also see an administration that doesn't seem to want to invest in the military even keeping up with the rate of inflation. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and if you talk to anybody in the, in the, in the Biden-Harris administration, and I'm, I'm sure that in the Harris-Walls administration this will continue, they'll say, oh, no, we, we've increased our defense spending. Uh, but if you look at it, you know, just for inflation, it's actually a cut. Uh, we are not keeping up with, um, with, with China, which is, our, which is the number one threat against the United States. Um, they are investing, uh, they, they, China has invested more in their conventional forces than any country since the end of World War II. That is more than Russia and the United States in a, in a, coming out of uh, during the Cold War. I mean, they are investing at a, at a clip that we are not keeping up. Um, and so morale is low. And so we talked to several folks who are still on active duty. Obviously, they can't speak up. And so we have to be their voice. So those of us who have served and are now veterans. And uh, you know, we always say that we, we took off our uniform, but that didn't end our service to our country. And so we continue to, to advocate for those things. Now, you, you mentioned white supremacy. I was led to believe that one of the great national security threats actually is climate change, which is why we need battery-powered tanks. Oh, that, that was included as well, yes. So, uh, so by the end of 2027, uh, the, the Department of Defense is trying to get to a zero emission fleet, and which is a, a disaster. I mean, they came out with a 50-page climate change report um, all about you know, how we need to address this problem. Um, but there was no such report about the military recruitment crisis and, and the readiness challenges that we're having right now. The military right now, uh, well, you just look at the, the, the army, right now 10,000 soldiers short of where we're supposed to be. Just two years ago, fiscal year 22, uh, we we're 15,000 soldiers short of our, of our goal. Um, and, and by the way, that is the amount of the entire division. I mean, that's as if, if you go down to Fort Stewart, um, that third infantry division where I, I, where I probably had the honor of serving, uh, that's like we're missing all the third infantry division. I mean, it is a serious issue. Um, and no such report on that, all right? And, and, and so, uh, and this year they're saying that we're on pace to, to meet our goal, uh, our recruitment goal, but if you pull back the onion a little bit, you'll notice that the only reason we're on pace to meet our goal is because they reduced the goal, the number of the goal, by 10,000. It's a, I mean, they, they think we're, we're not paying attention, but um, so those are the things that we're saying, look, we've got to pay attention, pay attention to these issues because we are not prepared for the next big fight. And those are the things that we care about. On recruitment, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but my understanding as well is one of the ways in addition to lowering the number is they've also lowered the standards for people to get into the military. Yeah. And, and that, that causes aspects of the fallout as well for maybe people who shouldn't necessarily go, but perhaps they've gone there to get out of going to jail or, or other issues, and that that can also impact our readiness. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at some of the, they've they, they tried to get creative now and are very active to the problem. They're trying now to get creative and find ways to work in the military. Some people who might not be the best fit. Um, and and, I, and, I, and to be fair, you know, we are in a place where a lot of young people just don't see the interest in serving. Um, the military is increasingly becoming an institution filled with people who are coming from families who have served. And so uh, most people who are serving in the military today, um, uh, it's, just, it's, it's a small circle, which is not good, uh, just the military is going to divide. Um, but it, so we're seeing all sorts of time, all sorts of instances where they are now reacting to the problem, whereas they could have been forward leaning and realizing that, hey, you know, we need to come up with a better pipeline to make sure that we aren't going to be in the once in a generation 
recruitment crisis. Um, and, and, and there are things you can do. I mean, I, I was in JROTC. Um, I actually don't come from a family that served in the military. Uh, my grandfather did uh, for, for a few years, but that, you know, he passed away before I was even, well, after I was born, but when I was very young. And um, so I didn't really have that necessarily military influence. It came from programs like JROTC, the Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps in high school. Uh, there's lots of programs out there that kind of, they can encourage service. Um, and but when you're in a position now where we're already two thousand savers short, well now it's too late to try to come up with something that's more than so those are the types of problems that we are continuing to see from an administration that clearly has been totally distracted. Um, and then they're also shooting themselves in the foot because you know it's interesting the army had a survey recently that said uh, what what trying to discover the main reason people don't go in the military. The number two highest mentioned reason why people aren't going to the military is because of the perceived racism in the military. Well, why are they perceiving racism in the military? Maybe it's because the Secretary of Defense had this nationwide stand down of our military because of so-called white supremacy. I mean, it's, so you just see this vicious cycle repeating itself and it, it's, it's been a disaster. So I, I guess what you're saying is doing recruiting at the rock isn't maybe necessarily the strategy to actually get people to come into the military, which is this, this ad campaign that I've been reading about that did nothing. I mean, what, what, what are the policies that you think might actually work to not just boost recruitment, but actually refocus on the military. And I realize in saying this, a lot of it depends on who wins the election. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think first and foremost is that, you know, young high schoolers, this might sound a little crass, but I mean, young high schoolers who are thinking about joining the military or even in college age, uh, you know, they are inspired. They want to go and kill bad guys. I mean, they want to do, they want to feel they are serving their country, making a difference not sitting in hours long of mandated transgender training with English with the donors that now. I mean, that's... Exactly, exactly. I mean, the mission of the military is to de deter, fight, and win our nation's wars. And so if we can get the military recentered on that, then I think that a lot of other things will kind of fall into place. Um, but we have been centered on that. And, and we can kind of talk about just, just the cascade effect of all the really kind of global embarrassments um, that the Biden-Harris administration has been uh, just kind of showing off to the world um, all over uh, just since they've been in, been in office. Yeah, and let's talk about that because it starts, I think Mitch McConnell was raised that, that it's probably not a coincidence that Putin did what he did in Ukraine after seeing how Biden handled Afghanistan. And we have this spill over effect around the world. The Wall Street Journal does a story about how Venezuela wants to invade Guyana and the Iranians, the Chinese, and the Russians are all there like, I didn't even realize Iran had a name capable of getting around the world. And yet, here they are south of us in Venezuela. Um, there does seem to be not just cascading effects, but also cascading crises that come from those effects. That's exactly right. When you project weakness, it invites chaos. And so we projected uh, just a, an amazing amount of weakness that botched withdrawal of Afghanistan, as I mentioned before. And then you saw uh, Putin was already kind of looking and trying to see when he could, you know, when he could uh, uh, make moves. And we have our president, President Biden, gets up and says, "Oh, you know, a minor incursion is no big deal." I mean, so we were inviting this type of uh, these type of activities. Uh, and then if you look at uh, just the emboldening of Iran. Um, the, 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 Harris, the Biden Harris administration has been so obsessed with you know trying to stop escalation. We don't want to need the, 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 the forces to do things to get escalated in the Middle East. Um, so they're doing everything they can. They are not enforcing sanctions against Iran, even though Iran has been, of course, um, supporting Hamas, Hezbollah, and all these other uh, kind of terrorist proxy organizations. Um, and still, by the way, have five Americans held captive right now in Gaza. Uh, so they're still releasing. You know, they're not enforcing sanctions. They released. Over eighty billion dollars to Iran since Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have been in office, and so when you do that, it shows that we are more afraid of our enemies than our enemies should be afraid of us. We should not be more afraid of escalating with Iran. If we are the greatest nation on earth, Iran needs to be afraid of escalating with the United States. And so they've totally got it, gotten it backwards. Uh, and I think that's why you've seen this, uh, this continued attacks, um, even on our soldiers. We lost, sadly, um, some soldiers moved from here to Georgia were killed in the attacks um, and, and, and just all over. And so it didn't have to be this way. When you project strength, our enemies are held at bay. And that's what we need to return to the White House. Um, otherwise, it's only going to get more worse. <laughs> I want to say it was 
six years, maybe longer than that, within the last decade though, Democrats made a concerted effort to go out and find veterans to run as Democrats because Republicans had seen to be of the markets aren't running it. So there are a number of people who have served in uniform who have gone to Congress as Democrats, but it doesn't seem like their positions necessarily are supportive of, of fixing the problems that they themselves have encountered. And they just are towing the Biden Harris line. That's exactly right. I mean, we don't need, I mean, look, I think the veterans are in a unique position to speak to their service. If they serve a country, they can, I think they have a serious voice, uh, and I think that's very important. Um, but when we have the Democrat Party going around just trying to find veterans who just parrot what they already want to hear, uh, and, and just kind of towing the party line, it's, it's not going to make things better in Washington. And so, you know, we, as I said, we're C4, and we, so we want issue ads and build specific issues. Um, but we have talked about uh, certain incumbents in office who have not been uh, doing their part to represent the policies that best uh, promote uh, the safe, strong, and free America. So, I, and, you know, I'm, I'm glad you raised that because it is a great distinction between a C3, which can educate but not actually advocate specifically on these policy issues, and a C4, which can and, and actually be engaged more aggressively. So, how are you guys engaging on the ground those issues? Yeah, well, uh, you know, we can't officially endorse pregnancy or anything like that, but um, but we do talk about, we, we've run ads uh, in different states, so we ran ads in Montana, we ran ads in, Ta in Texas, we ran ads in, in D.C., uh, we're actually uh, going to have some come out soon, uh, dealing with some of these issues, and what we talk about is we're highlighting the policy failures, um, because there are so many of them, you can kind of get lost in them. Uh, but we highlight the policy failures, we talk about the border. Um, and the one thing that we don't talk a lot, a lot about when we talk about the border is that uh, the Chinese, these illegal Chinese nationals have been just flooding the border. I mean, we, in 2021, there are about maybe 300, uh, 300 340 uh, illegal Chinese nationals that we need to apprehend across the border. Uh, just a few years later, we we're on track to have 25,000 Chinese illegal nationals just this year alone crossing our border, and that, of course, doesn't include gotaways. I mean, so stuff like that we're highlighting because there is just, the, the, the mainstream media is not going to, is not going to talk about Florida. I'm thankful for, for you and, and, and for I mean, Sam, you may be finally telling the truth. I mean, that is, it's huge. And so we try to amplify that, amplify uh, issues that, that Americans need to hear about, especially during the election year. Okay, and you'll have to forgive me, but I want to go off on a tangent with you okay. because you, you just mentioned that. A month, month and a half ago, Former Deputy Director of the CIA and the former Head of Central Command write an op-ed in Fort Affairs saying, we probably have bad people here. When you have 25 to 30,000 young Chinese military age males who have come into this country across the Mexico border, last I checked, there's a big ocean between us and China and they're going to Mexico and walking up. You have people from Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, uh, Mauritania, it, it, it seems like there is a crisis unfolding here that local law enforcement and the military will ultimately have to deal with. That there, people, when you have the, he's not a partisan guy, the former deputy director of the CIA and the former head of the Central Command, it, it seems like this is an obvious issue that needs to be dealt with that no one in Washington on the Democratic side really cares to deal with. That's exactly right. I mean, they have been just trying to raise awareness and sound the alarm saying we have a serious issue here in the United States. They believe that the threat is imminent. Uh, it was funny, I, I was an intel officer in the Army, and so many times people will kind of say, oh, so you know some secrets, you know, let me know, and you can't tell me anything about to kill me. I'm like, uh, there really is no secret. No secrets that are interesting, that are more interesting than what's open source information right now. The fact that there is a imminent threat against the United States from within, uh, and not to mention the fact all the threats from abroad. I mean, you don't even need to get into to see just how dangerous of a time we're living in right now. Um, and and it, and again, it did not have to be this way. This was a policy decision from the Biden Harris administration. Uh, and, and if you look at just some of the, the policy standpoints, I, I do believe Kamala Harris wants to make uh, wants to get even worse. Or she's even worse on Israel than, than, than Biden is. And so I, I think that we're going to see things get even worse um, if we see Harris walls and the White House. Yeah, I just got to say, and I made this point already. I don't think it's a coincidence that Netanyahu meets with Kamala Harris three weeks ago in private and goes back to Israel and begins like killing every bad guy as quickly as possible. <laughs> that probably whatever she said to him is like, I better deal with this problem as quickly as possible in case she gets away. Yeah, and thank God he did. I yeah. think. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think it, it showed that that you know even here in the United States, I mean, we could have done that too. It's, the difference is will. 
the, the Israelis have a will to fight and to defeat this. They're, they are not backing down. We have the capability, we have the intel, we have all the all the um, ability to do the same thing, to keep our enemy in the bay, uh, but we choose not to. Uh, and, and that is really uh, just the, the danger of the time that we're living in. Um, because I do think there is just kind of a, a spirit of complacency that's just kind of starting to arise. A lot of people just think that we are, we're fine, you know, I think 9-11 was just so long ago that for a lot of people that, you know, certainly nothing that serious could happen again. Uh, but we live in times right now where there truly is chaos all around the globe. And we have a, a president who has emboldened our enemies um, and has made it clear that if you want to attack American troops, there will, there will not be hell in bay. There will just be, you know, some, some, some very uh, kind of We'll kind of just stop the rest of the bed. We'll send you a strongly worded letter. Uh, I mean, even the Houthis who've been attacked. I was probably <laughs> just about to ask about this. The Read your don't, 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 and yet, I mean, they're firing on like aircraft carriers and yeah. bikes. Like, don't do that again. Yes. I mean, one of the first things they've been off was take the Houthis, delist the Houthis out of the terrorist or designation list. Well, that's crazy. Uh, and then all of a sudden they start attacking us and you wonder why this is happening. I mean, it's wild. Uh, and then and even if you look at the Biden administration, the Biden Harris administration, their ties to Iran, it is very frightening. I mean, you have, and you've talked about this, we have Rob Malley, who was the architect of the Iran nuclear deal, the failed Iran, Iran nuclear deal, um, all of a sudden, without explanation, gets suspended, gets a security credit suspended, and this report comes out that Iran has had this this kind of uh, influence campaign has infiltrated the top levels of the, of the Biden-Harris administration. Um, and people sending emails back to Iran saying, oh, it was our supreme leader, you know, we love this, it's crazy. Uh, and so, um, so, so after that, and then we have on 9-11, on the anniversary, the 22nd anniversary of 9-11, you have Joe Biden announce he's releasing $6 billion in these unfrozen assets to Iran. Um, and then of course, a few weeks after that, what happens? We had October 7th. Funded by Iran, the mosque where they killed 1,200 innocents killed uh, and, and over 100, um, 100 uh, innocent people taken hostage, including several Americans. Um, and so it's, it is not hard to see the lines and how it all connects. Uh, I mean, I have some friends that you know, I grew up with that are just conspiracy theories and stuff. And, I was, you know, and I'm like, you don't need a conspiracy theory. Just like, read the news. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You, you say that, and it, it is the least reported story seen before broke the news and no one wanted to cover that you have people who are sympathizers of Iran to the chief of staff to what the secretary of, of what the Navy or, or assistant secretary of defense, one of them, that's still on the job that is tied through leaks to Iran. It's, it's insane to me that we've got this level of infiltration. Yeah, and it, it's amazing just when, when you have the media in your pocket, and the media, the internet, is just not going to tell the Americans what's really going on. You see this kind of stuff happen, and, and, and it seems like the Biden Harris administration just kind of gets away with it. But that's why the onus is on us to call it out. And so that's why we do a lot of advocacy. Um, we, we're constantly writing around and talking about it. Um, I'm not afraid to go into uh, you know media that is not sympathetic to what I believe, you know, and, and uh, I'm willing to, to advocate and to present our view uh, because I stand on truth, right? It's really easy to, to speak truth, to, to speak uh, you know, speak what you believe when you know you're standing on truth. Uh, and, and I think now more than ever is the time for Americans who care about the issues who want a safer America, uh, want their kids to grow up in a safer America, now is the time to speak up. So I gotta ask you a question before we wind this up. Just you and your passion for this. I mean, I know you, you, you mentioned your service, but it's you, you've had this ride through politics and being on TV, and now you're here with an advocacy group advocating for veterans. Um, why spend your time on this as opposed to anything else? Yeah, well, I mean, it started when I was growing up, you know, my, my dad's a pastor, my parents have been involved in the show my life, and they told me that the number one thing, you serve God, you serve your country. And that was embedded in me. And as I mentioned, I joined JRPC and decided I wanted to serve my country and had the honor of going to West Point and graduated from there and, and served as an officer, an intel officer in the Army. And um, even after I decided to transition out of the Army uh, and head to, head to law school, I, I knew that I wanted to continue making an impact that I, that I cared. And, I, and I'm still in touch with a lot of folks um, who are still in the military. Um, I'm, I'm probably on the, on the younger end than some, some folks uh, uh, who are uh, you know, even in the organization. So I have a lot of friends who are still in. I graduated from West Point in 2015, uh, and then 
to finish my service in 2020. So it's not that long ago for me, and I'm hearing these reports of some of the things that they're you know, being managed, <coughs> so, like, this training session they're having to do, all the kind of misguided priorities. So I, just, I can't afford to sit back. I care about my country. Um, I have uh, my wife and I who's here with me, like Kai, but we have a one year old and a four year old, uh, and I want them to grow up in an America that is free. I want them to grow up in America where they don't have to be worried about the next attack or what's going to happen to them. So um, that's what inspires me to speak up, um, and, I, and I'm not stopping anytime soon. So. Mm -hmm. Fire, maybe we hold Congress, maybe we hold the Senate. I mean, what policy position should Americans be thinking about that they can just push Congress to pursue even if we don't control the White House? Yeah, I think it's one, invest in our military. Um, and, and two, you know, one, one thing I've, I've noticed is uh, this kind of rise in this belief that we can just retreat from the world, uh, you know, push our head in the sand here in the United States and just kind of pretend that everything will be okay. That, um, that Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, this kind of new axis of evil that's been forming, uh, you know, kind of, kind of forming in opposition to us and our, in our interests, um, that somehow they are not going to continue advancing and trying to uh, attack us. Um, and that is so, uh, I really do believe that these people, the axis of evil, um, they want to defeat the United States and defeat the American way of life. I happen to believe that in American exceptionalism, I believe that we live in the greatest country on earth. There's no way that they will succeed if we have the will to fight and to do what it takes. Um, but we can surrender it and surrender our leadership on a, on a global stage and surrender to China and have them write the rules on the future, have them write the rules on AI and all these kind of new technologies that are coming out. And we can, we can allow China and, and, and Russia to do that, um, or we can step up. And I think that uh, there's a lot of this kind of attitude of surrender. I would even but you know, this whole isolationist attitude, I think, is a form of surrender. Um, and, and I believe that we have to be able to uh, understand that a strong America is the only way that we have a safe America. And a strong military is a way to do that. And so, you know, in two years' time, in 2025, which is like 6th, our nation will celebrate our 250th birthday. And I think there's going to be a lot of, um, not a big battle over what story do we tell about America. And I happen to believe in the story that we live in the greatest country on earth and the greatest civilization that the world has known. Um, but there's another story uh, that is that, you know, America has, has been a force for evil around the globe and that our so-called meddling uh, around the globe has led to all this chaos and that we are the problem. Um, and that's the story that our enemies tell. Um, that's the story that you can hear if you go to Iran, North Korea, Russia, China. Um, that's the story that many people on the left are telling. Um, that's the story that um, in the Iran funding protests on, on American University, that's the story that they want promoted uh, on the left. Um, and sadly, we're starting to hear some of that on the right. Some commentators, some folks, you know, I don't know if it's just want to get clicks or what, um, are, are saying this absolutely, you know, we're making absurd statements about our country. Um, and if, if that's a story we're going to tell, the, the future will not be very bright. And so we need to make sure that we have folks who are willing to tell the truth, people like you who are willing to tell the truth, standing on principle that you believe. And I, and I think, I'm gonna speak for a lot of listeners here who just thank you for standing on principle. You weathered the storm through the years, ironclad, and I, I appreciate that because it's inspiring. <laughs> We spent 36% of GDP in World War II and had a lot of people die. We spent two or three percent now, and we think that's too much that it's actually will cost us a whole lot less to avoid war by being strong. Um, and it just that, I guess that's a message that we need to keep pointing out. That's exactly right. I mean, right now, now is the time to make those decisions, to, to really focus on what we need to do uh, to make sure we've got to improve our acquisitions process. I mean, there's so much, so many things we need to do to make um, to make sure we're in a better place. Um, but investing in our military, making sure that our that our soldiers are protected and that they are safe. You know, I mean, this even just the disaster, the Biden Air Project, this, it literally was breaking apart in the ocean, and he said, oh, we're gonna deliver all this aid, uh, and, and it, was a, it was a total failure, it was $200 million. I mean, some of that putting American soldiers in harm's way. Um, we, we can't have more of that. We've gotta make sure we have a defense policy that makes sense, that works, 
and, and to tell the story of America. So we are around the country uh, asking veterans, uh, even people who, even if you're not a veteran, you know other veterans and people who care about these issues, you know, join us. You can go to vetsonduty.org uh, and sign up with us. And we love to hear your story. Um, and, and again, even if you're not a veteran, but you care about these issues, join us too. Um, because we, we want to, now is the time to speak up. We can't wait until it's too late. We have to speak up right now. Um, and, and that's something that's near and dear to our hearts. And so we're, we're just gonna start. So before I round up, those of you who can't see it, but I've got this Shoe the Veterans on Duty video. And I know, I do want to introduce this video. Jeremy, again, thank you very much for coming and let's roll the tape. isolationist tendency that crops up in the country and it oftentimes does come from the right and so we've got to talk about that and, and I, I and I know we, we, I've seen some of the, the submitted questions here even for, for some of the, the people tomorrow and some questions I couldn't get to with Mitch McConnell on this that I do have this concern about people on the right talking ourselves out of that's exactly right. I mean, I think that a lot of it is just, um, I felt like we were really paying attention to what's going on and saying that, like, actually, we've tried isolationism before, uh, before World, World War II, it, it, it did not work. Uh, we tried it before World War I, it did not work. I mean, it, it's been, it has failed at every turn. And I know you talked about this a lot. I mean, when, when we, we look at history and we've tried things and it, and it continues to fail, well, that's why we're conservative. We, we look to those what works. And so, um, you know, I hope that people will kind of wake up to that issue and start to see it. But even more than that, I, you know, one concern that I have is that even on the right, a lot of people are, can't have the natural conversation and discussion about it. Let's actually go through the policy. Let's let's talk about the the kind of pros and cons. Talk about it. But instead, you know, people are just so quick to just you know, you know, rhino, neocon, or whatever, just all these ridiculous labels. And it, it's unhelpful. We have to figure out how to disagree better in this country, and we don't do that well. Uh, but things are not going to get better until we figure that out. Now, I'll say, roll the tape. <laughs> America's story is one forged through service and sacrifice. The courage to serve and the strength to fight. And the willingness to stand against those who threaten us around the table. At Veterans on Duty, that's what we believe. And that's what we've come together to defend. This devotion to duty, to America, is embedded in our ethos. It stays with us as we leave the military and transition to civilian life. And so it remains our mission to protect and fight for our freedoms wherever they are threatened. But not everyone sees it this way. Recently, America's credibility has been undermined and outright questioned. We have been reduced to a mere shadow of our former self. We are weaker and less respected. And our adversaries are more emboldened today than ever before. At home, our fellow citizens feel more shame than pride in their country. Veterans who wore the flag on their shoulders are watching in disbelief. Because we know that peace and stability in the world requires a strong America, an engaged America, an America whose military is prepared, equipped, focused, and lethal. Only then will America remain safe, strong, and free. The voice of veterans on issues of national security and defense are needed now more than ever. And it's the mission of Veterans on Duty to make sure that those voices are heard. Because we know this things. And our service didn't end when we took off our uniform. The fight continues and it's too important to ignore. We must stand up to all those who seek to undermine American strength at home and abroad. We are Veterans on Duty. Join us. 
Jeremy, thank you so much for coming on. So I gotta thank all of you for hanging out with me today because I know it's a long day. Tomorrow is a little bit shorter with we packed so much in today. Uh, my voice is largely shot for the day. Uh, I know some of you, by the way, have books to sign, and I intend to do that with you tomorrow. I've got another meeting I have to go to um, as we try to corral everybody and line stuff up for tomorrow. But I want to thank y'all for coming, and I really do want to thank, I mean, Brian Kemp and Rod DeSantis and Kevin Stitt and Kevin Hearn and Mike Pence and Mitch McConnell and uh, everybody we had today. Uh, I am deeply humbled that those guys would want to come to Atlanta and sit on the stage with me and and talk to you and have this conversation. Uh, and, you know, I, it's just, it, I was telling someone earlier today that even going back to when I was at Red State, it, it, it wasn't the largest, but it had enough influence because we were willing to have the honest and incredible conversations and not just be the shrill rah-rah, but actually dive into some substance. And so thank you for participating in the conversations. And I hope I did justice and will again tomorrow. So many of you submitted questions that I tried very diligently to weave into the conversations today, uh, including trying to like better understand the SEC football rules of bringing in others. So that's a, that was a question from a listener. Um, but I hope you have a great evening. Tomorrow, we've got another great lineup, and we will start with uh, former Senator Kelly Leffler. Uh, we will have, as well, some great conversations. Ryan Walters, who is the, the we didn't intend to be super Oklahoma-specific, but if y'all if y'all know who Ryan Walters is, he's the school board superintendent of Oklahoma, who is awesome, who is making teachers' unions around the country so angry as he champions school choice reform in Oklahoma and, and Bible curriculum and, and uh, in charter school curriculum in Oklahoma is a great guy, uh, super dynamic. We'll also have uh, Cole Musio from uh, Frontline Policy here in Georgia, who's one of the leading conservative, social conservative groups in the country. Senator Rick Scott from Florida, who's actually uh, looking to try to become the Senate Republican leader of the Senate. And of course, we have several people already today mentioned my dear friend, Chip Roy from Texas, who will, I'm sure, continue to come on stage and insult me on behalf of my wife and say the things to me that he wants me to know, that my wife wants me to know, that my wife won't actually say, so Chip gets the insults to throw my way from her. And Chris Wilson, who was actually Governor Stitt's uh, pollster and, and his poll for Ted Cruz and so many more. So thank you for coming. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. I promise I will spend a lot of time with you guys tomorrow and sign books. Right now, have a great night, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Found the bottle had been drank. Everybody's walking out, Jesse. Mm -hmm. There's your boy right there.